The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is in session. Please be seated. Yes, good morning, Ms Longbottom. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, this morning we'll hear from a panel of witnesses from RSL Tasmania, comprising Barry Quinn, John Hardy, Richard Hutchinson and Peter Williams. Might I ask that the witnesses be sworn or affirmed? John Hardy, do you swear by almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Barry Quinn, do you swear that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Richard Hutchinson, do you swear that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Peter Williams, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Operator, can you please display the tender list? Uh, commissioners, I tender the documents in the tender bundle in the manner in which they are described in the list. Thank you. That be accepted and then allocated the next consecutive numbers. Commissioners, can I just particularly draw to your attention, we won't be playing it this morning, but item number nine in the tender bundle is a video that's been prepared by RSL Tasmania that's relevant to the topics we will be talking about this morning. Um, commissioners, there are three broad issues that I propose to canvas with the panel this morning. The first of those issues is the challenges that are faced by veterans in Tasmania. The second is the role of RSL Tasmania as the peak body or ESO in the state and the challenges it perceives are faced by organisations such as itself and other ESOs in terms of engaging with its veteran community. And the third is the hub and spoke model that RSL Tasmania is seeking funding for in order to deliver a collaborative approach to access to services for veterans. Before turning to the substantive evidence, may I introduce each of the panel members, starting with Mr Quinn. Um, Mr Quinn, can you please state for the Commission your full name and current role? My name is Barry Philip Quinn and I am the State President of RSL Tasmania. Now, Mr Quinn, am I correct that you're a fifth generation Tasmanian returned serviceman? That is correct. Uh, my family has served uh, from pre-Federation, uh, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, as well as my own service. And you yourself joined the Australian regu Regular Army in 1991? That is correct. Uh, I enlisted in 1991. Uh, I was allocated to the Royal Australian Corps of Signals uh, as a radar operator. Uh, I served in the Army from 1991 to uh, when I was discharged in 2006, including three operational deployments uh, between two, 1995 and 2002. And um, Mr Quinn, how long have you been involved with the RSL for? Uh, I joined the RSL in approximately 2010, uh, where I uh, was a veterans advocate initially, um, working for RSL Queensland. Uh, upon relocation back to Tasmania, um, I joined my local sub-branch where I became the sub-branch president for the Signal RSL sub-branch in 2017. I held that position until 2020. Uh, in 2021, I nominated and was elected to the position of vice president of RSL Tasmania. And in June of 2021, I was then appointed the acting state president. Uh, and subsequently, I was elected as the state president in February this year. And Mr Quinn, um, you mentioned that you originally joined a sub-branch in Tasmania. Where was that sub-branch located? So uh, my hometown is Signet um, and I joined the Signet RSL sub-branch. 
Thank you. If I can move to you then, um, Mr Williams, can you please state for the Commissioner your full name and current role? Uh, my, uh, my current position is the Northern Director for RSL Tasmania and uh, I'm also the Secretary of the Lawn Cessna Subbranch. And in terms of your role as Northern Director, what geographic area, just in terms of sort of major towns, do you have so, oversight over? So that's the, uh, basically the north and northeast of the state. Okay. And am I correct, Mr Williams, that you served for 47 years in the armed forces? Yes, that's correct. I joined in 1974. And was that in the army? Yes, I've served both in uh, um, the Australian Regular Army and Army Reserve during that period of time. And when did you leave the armed forces? Um, I, I went uh, CRA in the Regular Army um, in, at the end of 2016, and I just finished uh, with my reserve service going to CRA in December last year. And how long have you been involved with the RSL in Tasmania? I've been involved in um, RSL Tasmania for the past about five and a half years, but previously that I was a member of RSLs across Australia plus Defence RSL as well. Okay. Uh, if I could move to you, Mr Hardy, can you please state for the Commissioners your full name and current role? Good morning. My name is John Hardy. I'm the CEO of RSL Tasmania. And Mr Hardy, am I correct that you were a soldier in the British Army? I was. Uh, I joined as a private soldier into the 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, which is basically their rapid response, go everywhere unit in 1987. Uh, I, last, I left service in 2009 uh, as a commissioned officer. And you also, in the armed forces, saw operational service? Yep, so I saw multiple uh, operational service be peace support in Northern Ireland, uh, five tours, uh, combat in Iraq, a uh, couple of tours, Afghanistan combat, a couple of tours, uh, about six years worth of operational service. And how long have you held the role of CEO, CEO of RSL? Uh, seven months. And did you have any prior involvement with the RSL? Uh, no. Uh, the first time I saw Tasmania was when I left the aircraft seven months ago to take this role up. Uh, thank you. If I could you move to you, Mr Hutchinson, can you please state for the Commissioners your full name and current role? Um, my name is Richard Hutchinson. Um, I'm functioning as a strategic partner for RSL Tasmania. Uh, I'm assisting in relation to um, fundraising and, uh, and strategy. <laughs> Am I correct, Mr Hutchinson, you come from a civilian background? I do. I had a, 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 a very short um, amount of service um, in the early 90s. Um, uh, I have family history of service. I'm definitely a very passionate Australian, um, but uh, I haven't served in active service. And what branch of the armed forces did you serve in for that uh, brief period? I, I joined the, um, the army okay. um, and um, I was accepted to the OPTU course, but um, didn't continue. Okay. And Mr Hutchinson, I understand that in 2021 you formed a not-for-profit organisation to address veteran suicide? That's correct, yeah. Uh, and what's the name of that not-for-profit organisation? Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's an extension of a proprietary limited company that we have, which is Vendor Proprietary Limited, um, which is a software as a service provider. And um, the businesses that we're operating as not-for-profit are veteran finance, um, veteran energy and veteran internet. And what's the genesis of your involvement in the field of addressing veteran suicide? Um, I have uh, lived experience of suicide, um, including um, uh, friends in service who I've lost. Um, and I believe that it's an important cause that needs to be addressed. Um, and given that I had the ability to do so, I felt that it was something that I was called to do and um, I'm providing what service I can in order to assist what I think is one of the most important causes in Australia at the moment. And Mr Hutchinson, how long have you been involved with RSL Tasmania? Um, since uh, late January of this year um, was our first, our first communication and we've formed a, a partnership since then. And have you had any prior involvement with RSL either in Tasmania or Australia more broadly? I have um, in, uh, in, in Victoria. Um, had some involvement with RSLs, um, both on a, a voluntary and sort of support basis. Um, so I understand how the organisation works and I've seen um, some of the challenges around, uh, around veteran engagement with RSLs. Okay. Now, the, the first topic I want to ask 
the panel about is the challenges that are faced by veterans in Tasmania. Um, we heard yesterday that the 2021 census identified that there are 17,515 veterans in Tasmania. Perhaps if I can address this question to you, Mr Quinn, do you believe that's an accurate figure? We believe that um, it's not accurate, even though that is what the data says. Um, when a census is conducted, you will always have people that don't answer questions. And so our estimation is that there, there could be up to an additional 10% of veterans that reside in Tasmania that didn't tick that question on the census. And that would actually push the numbers up towards 20,000 veterans living in Tasmania. And why do you think there is a propensity for veterans not to identify themselves in surveys such as a census? There could be a number of reasons. Um, and dealing with the Royal Commission as we are, um, there are, there are veterans who are not proud of their service um, for their own reasons. Um, so therefore they don't wish to identify as a veteran. Um, and I, I think that if that's the case, that, that would be the main reason why they didn't take that question. Okay. Um, and, and Mr Quinn, either you or another member of the panel, are you aware of the number of DVA clients in Tasmania? Uh, our uh, current uh, estimation is there's about 8,872. Um, DVA would have the full number. Um, but that's the figures that, that we are working on. So when you look at the number of DVA clients um, that we're aware of, as opposed to the total number of veterans that actually reside, uh, it's, it's about 40, 30 to 40 per cent. So it's quite substantially lower than, uh, than those veterans that may have entitlements uh, and need to be recorded within the DVA. And Mr Williams, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Um, that's remembering those veterans that, that we actually see. Exactly. That includes that. That sort of looking at the figures um, is obviously the veterans that we see. There's an awful lot of veterans we don't see. To give you a sort of an idea, um, advocates in Launceston have seen since the beginning of January close to 900 veterans. Okay. Um, now, can I ask? Do you think that the veteran community in Tasmania, say over the last 10 years, is a stable number or is it growing? And I might just ask all of you if you could just speak up a little bit so everyone can hear you. John? I think the, it would be fair to say that the number of veterans that come into Tasmania would have to reflect the number of service personnel. So if the service personnel number goes up, then the service number of veterans would increase in the same rate. Uh, Tasmania is a location that people like to, to settle in. It's not a great place for the young, but it's a great place for people that have sort of done their time and want somewhere to go to settle down. I mean, it's a, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, so I think that's why the number will probably fluctuate great, greatly. Like I said, we think it's about 20,000. Uh, I think that's a fair comment. Okay. Um, now, if I can just shift a little bit and focus on the challenges that face the veteran community in Tasmania. We've heard evidence um, yesterday about some of these challenges, including a geographically disparate population, um, disproportionate numbers of homelessness amongst veterans in Tasmania as compared to the general population, and higher numbers of younger and older veteran pensioners. Are they matters that you as a panel would agree um, are particular challenges that face veterans in Tasmania? Mr Williams? Um, yes, look, and as we expand our services, we are increasingly encountering uh, homeless veterans. Uh, for example, in the North, uh, welfare teams up there have dealt with about 34 homeless veterans in the North and Northwest of the state in the last five years. And we're already finding down in South in Hobart, we've um, seen a number of homeless veterans. And is there a particular age demographic of veterans that have been affected by homelessness, just anecdotally? Um, what we're seeing is a spread of veterans across different, um, from Vietnam through to modern service. And we actually have seen a number of females um, as, with children as well. Okay. Um, now, in 2019, I understand RSL Tasmania commissioned a research project to better understand the challenges that are faced by veterans. Now, I, I appreciate that the research project has some limitations, and I'll just suggest these to you and let me know if I'm wrong about that. 
Uh, the first is that the average age of those responding to the survey was about 72. Am I correct about that? That would be correct. And also the um, survey was only uh, given to RSL members. So it is a very restrictive number. It doesn't represent the whole numbers of state. Um, and, and am I correct as well? One of the topics that was touched upon in the survey um, concerns mental health. In that respect, do you know if, if um, the responders to the survey were asked to self-report um, whether or not they face particular mental health issues as opposed to there being evidence about a particular diagnosis? It was self-reporting. Self-reporting, okay. Can I ask, um, what did the survey reveal about the mental health of veterans in Tasmania? Perhaps if I can ask you, John, that question. Uh, Look, I think it, it, we've got to probably refine the question. And the question is that it, the, the survey was one survey. Since then, we've had two other surveys. We've had the Utah study. And then from that, we've got some fairly accurate information from the 2021 census. So it's always, it's always, an, it's always an, evolving, an evolving issue in regards to where we currently are. So we've got, when we answer the question, we can't answer the question from that survey. We've got to answer the question using all the information we, ha we have at hand. So we've got an holistic approach. I think look, the, the first challenge that the Tasmanian study made loud and clear was that we, ha we are the second most remote population in Australia. So that's, that in itself is a really big challenge. Let me explain. So if you think of some of the things that people have gone through recently with COVID, so we got isolated, we had to do things we never wanted to do before, we had to operate in a certain way, we didn't leave our homes, we lost our networks, we lost our social connections. Those are the challenges that people that leave the services have every day. They are taken away from uh, something that they believe in, they are taken away from a routine, uh, they have to now operate to a new set of rules. So this is a, an effect. I mean, the effect can be drawn in comparison. The effect of COVID, the mental health issues it had with the population, exactly the, it's the same level it would have with veterans when they leave the service. What we've got to do is we've got to pick these veterans up. We have to pick them up the day they leave. We have to, we have to reach out to the veteran as he leaves and said, hey, we're a veteran hub. We're in Tasmania, you're coming to Tasmania. When you get here, we'll give you a call. We'll give you a call and we'll say, two weeks time, we'll just link back, see if we need anything. And can I just unpack that a little bit yeah. more? So you talked about at the outset, remoteness, geographic remoteness being an issue. How do you see that interplaying with that, that comment you just made about the need to engage with veterans? So I think if we understand one of the biggest issues is going to be remoteness and all the things that you faced with COVID, they face with leaving the service. It, I think that's a fair explana explanation. I think if we then unpack that a little bit, we've got, we've got to be able to reach out and pick these people up, but we've also got to be able to deliver a local service by local people to local veterans. That works. We know the community works. It's the one thing that does work. And that, and that is the concept of the hub and spoke. It's the concept of Veteran Hub. That's, that's, that's phase one. This, the DVA grant will allow us to do that. Without it, we cannot do it. And you're talking there about the hub and spoke model. Yeah. That's, and I will come back to that. Um, if I could just focus for a moment on just the challenges. So you've mentioned remoteness. Mm -hmm. um, Barry or Richard or Peter, would there be anything else you would add in terms of the challenges that face veterans in Tasmania? Uh, the big one is probably provision of services, mm -hmm. um, healthcare services, where we have um, services that have to be provided for veterans in crisis, where they've got to travel to um, Melbourne, to Heidelberg to get support. Um, and the limitations here in Tasmania of some of those um, more urgent services and our ability to uh, get a veteran in care is severely hampered. So you're talking there about acute mental health services. Yes, that's correct, yeah. What about, for example, outpatient mental health services? Is, the, is, is that an issue that faces veterans in Tasmania? Um, there is services that are provided, through, obviously, through Open Arms and a couple of other services, and um, we would link into those services that are available to the community at this time. 
And take, for example, open arms. Does that have a geographic spread across the state or is it is it confined to major hubs? No, it tends to centre around Hobart and Launceston um, and the services up the uh, northwest are particularly um, light on with veterans having to travel to um, either Launceston or Hobart to get services. Okay. Barry, is there anything that you would add to that? I think um, that with regards to outpatient services, there are there are shortages and, and there are gaps with regards to, for example, GPs having the ability to treat veterans as well, um, especially when it comes to providing medical reports to uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and we are aware of cases where GPs um, do not wish to treat veterans because of having to deal with the bureaucracy of the department through time and cost. So that's a barrier, obviously, to having a desire to treat veterans. What about um, veteran competency amongst GPs in terms of understanding particular mental health issues? Mr Hutchinson, would you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, one of the things that's been, um, you know, it, one of the things that's been brought to um, my attention by um, uh, the medical fraternity, um, uh, including representatives of the AMA and uh, emergency doctors um, and psychiatrists, is that they are not actually able to identify who and is who is and is not a veteran in Australia. So this is not just a Tasmanian issue. Um, but uh, I know that John, um, when he um, left the UK service, um, it, when he went to the doctor, they knew that he was a service person. So it's very difficult for a, a emergency room to know how to handle a veteran or to know what special way to treat them um, when they don't actually know that someone's a veteran. So if they don't choose not to identify and say, I'm a veteran, no one knows. And can you just, just expand and explain to the commissioners the particular reason why that veteran status will be relevant to the type of care, for example, mental health care that a someone might be given? Absolutely. In well, what I've been told by the professionals in the, in the space who, who handle these people is that they do require special treatment, even from the way that you approach them, um, from the way that you handle them and, and being aware of that they may have um, special conditions or special needs. Um, one, one odd one that I thought was that uh, often they don't like to be approached from behind, um, that they can startle easily. They often present to emergency rooms as a last resort in a state of distress um, and that it would be, what they've said is that it would be great if um, medical records were uploaded to My Health so that it was actually identified on a medical record in some way that somebody is a veteran so that any GP or anybody treating a veteran knows that they are a they are a veteran and therefore can, if necessary, pass them to somebody who is more veteran capable. Mm -hmm. It's not just about being veteran friendly, it's also about being veteran capable. And in terms of that issue of veteran capability, do you um, have any oversight about whether or not that kind of training is available for medical professionals? It's, it's not at the moment. Now, doctors do need to do certain units in order to stay up to date and an uh, organisation called PTSD Frontline, um, headed by a chap by the name of Peter Worth, um, is uh, very keen to um, uh, ensure that doctors are actually skilled and treated in relation to PTSD. And that's not just veterans, but also first responders. And he proposes that there should be units or modules which are required for doctors to complete in order to ensure that they are capable and informed. Um, and if they were capable and informed, then they could be identified as being veteran capable, and then you could stream people towards them, which is part of what we can achieve through Veteran Hub. Okay. Yeah. If I can just take a step back and just focus on that issue of what we know about challenges faced by veterans in Tasmania, do you have any data about, um, with respect to the rates of suicide and suicidality amongst veterans in Tasmania? John? So it's... it's this information we can't gather. This, this information would need to come from government or state, or sorry, federal or state. It, it's not something that the it's not something the RSL could easily get hold of. All we can draw information from is national information. From that national information, you can then draw a really rough percentage of how many veterans you've got on the island compared to how many people commit suicide, and draw a rule of thumb of the, what that may be. But there is no there is no information that we can get right now that says. We have got a set number of people who have committed suicide on the island. I, I would suggest anybody would struggle to get that information. Okay. Um, now, obviously, we've heard about a couple of 
barriers you know, or risk factors in terms of suicide and suicidality for veterans. Is there anything else that you would add in terms of risk factors that exist at the moment? Mr Williams? Are we talking risk factors or other things that prevent us um, getting the services? Both. Um, probably one on the side of the advocacy side is um, the ability to find GPs that when they're giving a um, prognosis for a service-related injury, that when they write that, it's written in a format that is accepted by DVA to actually prove that particular um, um, in injury or, or, uh, or, or prognosis that he's got. And we do have a lot of to and throwing to make sure that that, that is done. And there's a reluctance of GPs to produce prognosis that meet the requirements of DVA. Okay. Uh, now, I just want to shift a little bit and ask you some questions about RSL Tasmania and its role as a peak body in this state. Uh, perhaps if I could start with you, Mr Hardy, could you just give an overview of what you see the role of RSL Tasmania as a peak body as being? Yeah, so I think, look, a, a peak body has a, responsi a responsibility. It's, the peak body is not about being RSL Tasmania, uh, and it's not about being an ASL, ESO. It is about the good and benefit of veterans. And that is the way that we must act as a peak body. Now, to do that, we've got to gain, gain, the, gain the trust of other ESOs in this field. And we've also got to recognise and, and accept the elephant in the room that in the past, the RSL, or at whatever level, may have acted with the right behaviour. So we have, we've had to take that forward as RSL Tasmania. We are the only peak body, uh, i.e. RSL peak body, so it's very important that we embrace that. And we've got to roll this journey together. We've got to do things together. We've got to communicate together. We've got to collaborate together to deliver services for the veterans. So therefore, our role as the peak body is to lobby government, be it state government, and it is to act as a collective voice with, not for, with the other ESOs on the island of Tasmania. And do you perceive that bringing our other ESOs together with RSL as a collective voice is a present challenge RSL Tasmania faces? Yes. So it would be fair to say that this will be a journey that will take some time. As we gain trust and as people start to realise that we're not just talking about RSL Tasmania. So I'll give you one very quick example. When we put the uh, application in for the $5 million for Veteran Hub, we put an application, we put some of that money forward for other ESOs. So for instance, we put money in for the Vietnam veterans. We put money in for Mates for Mates. These are not RSL organizations or our RSL organization. They are ESOs, but we understand and we completely accept that we must work together. But to work together, we've got to show by example, that that's what we intend to do. Okay. So that's obviously an issue that exists at the organisational level. What about the cohort of veterans that engage with RSL Tasmania? For example, I understand that the 2019 research project identified that RSL Tasmania is facing a battle for its survival because of the average age of its members. Um, can I ask perhaps Mr Quinn, can you comment upon whether or not that is a current issue for RSL Tasmania? It is an issue. Uh, it's, it's not just an issue for RSL Tasmania, it's an issue for all ex-service organisations. Um, historically, um, most veterans don't turn to an ESO until later in life. Um, and um, that's when they're comfortable. So they, they could do their 10 to 15 years of service, they have a period of time and then they join an ESO. Uh, RSL Tasmania is acutely aware that, that um, our membership um, is struggling uh, with, as I said, with the, with the same of other ESOs. Uh, we have been engaging, <coughs> excuse me, we have been engaging with other ESOs and we've also been engaging with the veteran community. Uh, and one of the points that we've identified that um, Veterans retire to Tasmania, as John said recently, uh, pre previously. Um, so we do have that older demographic 
Um, a lot of younger veterans, when they do join the military, they leave Tasmania. They don't necessarily return until later in life, uh, myself being plenty case. Um, be that as it, as it is, um, we are engaging with younger veterans and we, we are um, recruiting, or I, I don't like to use the word recruiting, but we do have younger veterans joining now as well. What proportion or percentage of your membership is, say, in the age group 45 and younger? I'll defer to John. John's got some figures. Okay, so, so currently our current membership is uh, 2,961 as we stand now. Uh, that may have changed in the last 25 minutes, so please don't hold me to that. Uh, so that's the membership we've currently got. Previously, in a previous year, about 10% would be under 45. Uh, however, this year has seen an increase of 7.5% in the membership of 45 and below. So it is moving in the right direction. But it's got to be worth saying that there's a, there's a lot more work to do in this field. We have to engage with the younger veterans. That is being done particularly well in places like Wynyard, where they have actually got a young board uh, and they are striving forward. Uh, and they have done some really good work with younger veterans in that area. I think you may have even spoke to some of them. Uh, and it's got to be said that, that that is the sort of way forward we strive to go. In the South, again, our young membership is up by 4.5% uh, on a previous year. But again, we've got to accept and work with younger veterans and try and understand their needs. Now, some young veterans will just leave the military and just want to get on with their lives. Simple as that. Uh, I'm a classic example. I didn't even include myself as a young veteran probably the last couple of years because I left the military and wanted to get on with, you know, building a home, looking after the family and moving on. You will get that with younger veterans. But as I go back to, what we have to do is we must pick them up as they leave service. That's a massive gap. Uh, if we engage younger veterans and they start to see and start to see we're working together as an ESO and a collective group, they will then start to, they will then start to trust what we're trying to do. We've got to gain their trust by collaboration with all the ESOs. If I could, you just said then before Mr. Hardy, we have to pick them up as they leave service. Yeah. How do you achieve that? Okay, we, we achieve it with help. So the ADF knows when people are leaving the service, like any other service anywhere in the world. As they leave service, uh, part of the Veteran Hub concept is we will have uh, information officers. And what they will do is they will receive the information from the ADF, and the ADF will say, we have got Private Smith, or Digger Smith, who's coming in tomorrow, or he's going to leave this location and he's going to co-locate back into Tasmania. At that point, we need to be making contact with that individual and saying, we're Veteran Hub, not RSL, we're Veteran Hub, we're here to help you. I'm a, I'm a relationships officer or information officer. If there's anything we can do, let us know, find out when they're going to come in. And then when they come in, give them a call back and say, look, hey, you've landed in Tasmania. How can we help you? Now at that stage with Veteran Hub, we can either keep the contact there or we go into the virtual hub where we start to provide services, not RSL services, everybody's services. And then we can pick them up because when a lot of people leave the service, they don't understand about doctors. They don't understand about bulk billing. They've got no idea. I don't know now. Uh, and we've got to be able to get to a place where we can help them. Some of these people come in great distress. So to go to DVA, we had a discussion yesterday about this, and you could be given a pile of paperwork for, a norm, for, for someone who's not in distress. That's fine, we can deal with that. But if someone's in distress, we need to pick them up and say, look, you're going to DBA tomorrow, would you like someone to come with you? Or get the paperwork, we'll meet you at this spoke in your local area, and we'll get someone to go with you. So would it be correct to say, Mr Hardy, the start of that process is getting information from the ADF about the members that are leaving its service and relocating to Tasmania so yeah. you can start the process of engaging with them. I, I, don't, I don't know whether that information would come from the ADF, okay. but it's information that we need. We need to know when people are leaving service so we can engage with them, so they feel that they are being looked after from day one. Most won't need it. The ones that do are the ones that are gonna be in great harm later on. 
Mr Williams, is there anything you would add to that? Yeah, look, as a person that recently transitioned five years ago, um, the and we've spoken to transition cells here in Tasmania and that, um, and there is a reluctance to give us that information because of privacy concerns. Um, but it should be seen the reason we're going is to talk about the services that we're going to provide, and they're not they're veteran services, they're not RSL services. So we need to have a bit of a touch point where we have the opportunity to say, here in Tasmania, you've come here, you've transitioned out of the Defence Force, here is what we can help you with and, and the services that are available and the people that you need to talk to. Here's a list of the names, locations, organisations that can assist you with your transition. Um, and there's a lot of areas we cover, employment and all sorts of things. It's not just DVA veteran services. And so I take you to be saying, Mr Williams, that you consider it important that in that respect, particularly because of privacy concerns, that the information is given at a level of service provision rather than as membership, for example, of RSL Tasmania. The last thing that happens is when somebody comes to a service in our organisation, they get handed a membership form. This, this, this really is not about the RSL. It's not about membership. This is about delivering services for our veterans. Yes. We've we got to... We got to We've got to discuss that. It's not about membership. We don't care if you are not a member. We care that you don't commit suicide. That's what we care about. And I take it from that, Mr Hardy, you see it as being critical to provide those services and, and to avert the risk of suicide and suicidality, to step away from a particular organisational label and really turn focus to service delivery. Yeah, so I think as we've definitely tried to push from the start, this is about a concept where we use a new name. We use Veteran Hub as the name, we deliver services through that name. When, so when someone new leaves the service, we engage with that person not as RSL, we engage as Veteran Hub. So therefore they understand that this is about a inclusive group of ESO organisations that want to help them with services. You know, and this goes from yoga through to employment. You know, it goes from employment through to giving them, getting them contact to a local doctor that we know is friendly to ex-service personnel. This information, if we can get that information across, that will make a substantial difference to the life of veterans in Tasmania. Mr. Hutchinson, is there something that you would add to that? Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Um, in today's mental health um, space, um, going upstream, has been identified as being really key to harm minimisation and harm prevention. And as such, within the Veteran Hub concept, um, we've broken um, services into three categories outside of ESO services that are provided specifically by various ESOs. But to have medical treatment, which is anything that's done by a doctor, um, therapeutic interventions, which is anything that's done by a qualified professional who is not a doctor, which includes psychologists, um, therapists, um, art therapy, equine therapy, all those sort of um, treatments. And then lifestyle supports, um, which is yoga, bushwalking, mountain bike riding, um, any sort of activity, all those sort of healthy things that we know lead to living a healthy, healthy body, healthy mind. And I see this as being a tiered structure where if you reach out to veterans whether they be what I would refer to in business as pent up demand, being the 17,500 already existing veterans in Tasmania, or the ones who are coming off the conveyor belt being discharged now, um, that if you can reach out to these people as Veteran Hub, not as RSL, and offer them this tiering of services, that you can provide the lifestyle supports which prevent them from needing therapeutic intervention, which then prevents the necessity of, of medical treatment. Whereas currently, I'm advised by people who work at the coalface, keeping veterans alive on a daily basis, they feel that there's not a lot between the abyss and the psych ward. And in Tasmania, the psych ward is Ward 17 at the Austin Hospital, previously the Repat Hospital. And um, a friend of mine has referrals sent to him when they can't help them um, there. And so they're going to the psych ward, then coming back to a therapeutic intervention, whereas we really should be going upstream offering lifestyle supports so as to engage socially, um, uh, prevent, uh, have a healthy body and a healthy mind. And in that social engagement and that, and that grouping, identify people who may be in need earlier 
um, so that you can provide that therapeutic intervention if necessary or refer it on to a mental, a mental health or a physical health practitioner being a doctor. Um, if, if we don't follow any of that and we just go straight to a, a psych ward, um, often you're actually misdiagnosing or mistreating people because you're then diagnosing people with mental illness, whereas they may have another condition, and, and that's something that we um, could probably talk more about, which is the difference between PTSD and moral injury, for example, um, one being a mental health diagnosis and one being a, a condition. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's pretty key. And in terms of the particular services that this veteran hub model will provide, it's at that first level um, of actually facilitating either through um, RSL Tasmania or other ESOs in the hub, though that first layer of services, and then a referral to the second. So, so yeah, to having a case manager who picks up, the, as in a, a case manager who picks up the client as they come through, so an engagement officer picks them up first when they, when they leave the service or when we first connect with them, and then following on from the engagement officer, you have a case manager, and the case manager functions a little bit like a router, handing them between the services they require in order to take care of them. So it doesn't cease with lifestyle support. They can refer them to therapeutic intervention, which we believe will be, be suitable, and on to medical treatment with doctors who have been through PTSD training and, and appropriate training, so they're veteran friendly and veteran capable. But there's a single individual within the ESO who has responsibility for oversight to ensure sort of a collaborative approach. Yeah, that one individual, care. a relationship yes. which is established, which has been identified as being really key, that you yeah. need that relationship with a person and you need that relationship before it's critical, before it's a crisis, because when a crisis occurs, you might have minutes and it's too late to establish a relationship. So having the relationship early allows you to provide the support when it's needed. Mr Williams, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so fundamentally exactly what Richard's saying, so that when a client comes in, he may come in for one particular service, but what we invariably find is there's two or three other services that he also we can pass on or send the, uh, or him or her be passed to another service provider. So it's really this whole looking after and uh, the client in an end-to-end -end fashion from the time he comes in to the time that he settled and um, any conditions or requirements that he has have been met by the same body of people dealing with. He may be dealing with different ESOs, but he understands he's on a journey with the same people. Mm. That continuity of contact it's, with a single... It's, it is the most important thing. If we, if we can maintain that um, and improve that, and develop it further, then we're going to have more success and prevent them getting to the serious stage where we I have think it's worth signing. It, it, it's just worth saying that we, we all understand as we go somewhere new, if we've got a point of contact with that somewhere new, and it is somewhere new for them, and then they feel they've got constant touch points, if we then need to move them to, to case management, they then stay in case management. They don't then drop through the safety net. So we're not providing one service and then saying, that's it, see you in 25 years, they're, in, they're then in the system. So we keep looping back to them for as long as they, don't, they want to be there. If we can't do that, then what will happen is we'll do one term of service, we'll treat them something, and then they'll disappear. And then we'll have an issue later on that we potentially have an issue later on down the line. And that's why we've got to keep the touch point. The va most veterans won't need it, but it would still be nice for them to say, when we come to Tasmania, these people will get in touch with you. If you need help, give them a shout. And that, that could be anything. We're talking about employment as well. We're talking about a wide spectrum of things to make sure that we keep them focused on what they need to do to stay in a really good place. Sorry, Mr. can I just Quinn? add to that as well? There's also information sharing between the ESOs within the hub. So when, we're, um, if, when we have that initial engagement um, officer that um, creates that relationship with that veteran and their family, um, they will be able to identify that there will be services that potentially may be required or provided by Legacy, for example, or uh, Open Arms or Mates of Mates or RSL. Um, and what that allows is a collection of information for that veteran and their family, because it's not just about treating the veterans, you also have to treat the families of the veterans, because they're the people that have to live uh, and deal with the issues uh, of a veteran service on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I'm going to come back and ask you some more questions about the Veteran Hub 
in a moment. But first, I want to um, circle back round to the role of RSL as peak body in relation to funding. Now, obviously, the services that you're talking about require funding. Um, I think you mentioned, Mr Hardy, that you see part of the role of RSL Tasmania as a peak body being to engage with the state and federal government um, in relation to the provision of services. Um, in that respect, what would your observation be about assumption of responsibility of services at federal and, common, at federal and state level, um, and whether there's clarity about that or not? Yeah, so I think look, it's, it's absolutely vital as the peak body, whoever the peak body may be, that that peak body engages at its correct level. So for instance, if we're the peak body at state level, which we are, we engage with state and we make state aware of any issues. So for instance, I'll give you a very quick example. On the uh, 15th of June, we engage with state government about their strat plan, which is basically their mental health and suicide plan going forward. Because we engaged with them and we said, look, uh, we believe that veterans should be on that list and they, they're not on the list currently. Uh, because we engage with them, we are now engaging with TAS Health to see how we can move the veteran space forward on the island uh, and how we can make it better. But part of that engagement is to include all the ESOs. So all the main ESOs have been invited the 10th of August to RSL Tasmania to take part in that collective session with TAS Health. It's absolutely crucial that this is a combined voice. It's not our voice. Uh, and I think we, we just, that's got to be continuously said. This is not a power grab. It is about the good and benefit of veterans in Tasmania. Uh, I think, look, in terms of, as I always reflect back to, the, the problem with state and federal governments is that states see one thing, federal see the other thing. I accept that. But the issue is if we have one suicide at federal level, so let's say a veteran commits suicide, that will affect between 10 and 20 people at state level. So federal deal with one person and then, then state have to deal with 20 people. That, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And that's one of the main issues. There needs to be, well, we are trying at state level to be more inclusive, more collective, to work together for the good and benefit of veterans. Federal and state must do the same thing. If I could just unpack that a little bit. Firstly, in terms of the collaboration at an ESO level, does that, does that trust and engagement exist at the moment? Uh, okay, the trust and engagement is getting better. Uh, but it's got to be, so it's got to be led by us. So we have got to walk into the room and expose all, accept the mistakes that we have made in the past and move forward. If we do that, then people will slowly start to trust us. If we're engaging with government, and when I write a letter to state government, I send that letter to all the ESOs, they know what I'm saying. If I then take that forward and say, right, we now want you to come to Collective Together to speak to TAS Health, for instance, is a good example, then we're asking, them, we're asking them into the room. So for instance, out of the, we deal with about 29 ESOs in, in Tasmania. Currently, uh, the invitation for the 10th, we've had seven replies. So, so the question also has to be asked, how do we certify ESOs? How do we find out that we're all delivering services? Because there's a lot of ESOs, including ourselves. I include myself in that, in, in that factor. There's got to be a need for certification of what ESOs deliver and what is actually a true ESO and what isn't a true ESO. I think that's a fair question. And do you, do you see that certification playing a role just in terms of identification, but also facilitating collaboration? Yeah, so we've got to, we've got to facilitate collaboration. We've absolutely got to do that. None of the ESOs are big enough to do all of this on their own. We definitely aren't, and we're a big one. We've got to do it together. We've got to work together. There are specialist ESOs that deal in certain areas who deal with things much better than we do. We deal in other areas much better than they do, but we've got to work together. And if I could just circle back around to that engagement with the government and the particular example you gave about the strategy um, in relation to preventing suicide. Obviously, as we heard yesterday, Tasmania has a particular ministry 
with respect to veterans affairs, yes. um, but obviously it also has separate ministries dealing with mental health. Um, what has RSL Tasmania's experience been of the engagement with those respective ministries in terms of issues affecting the mental health of veterans? Uh, look, I, I can only speak in terms of seven months. That's how long I've been the CEO. Uh, the first couple of months of being the CEO have been very much based around trying to find out what's going on. I, I think it's fair to say over the last four months, we have definitely started to engage with government. If you were to go on our Facebook site, you would see that we speak to all our members on there on the social media so they know what we're doing. So our engagement is improving. But to be fair to state as well, we're coming from a new start. So they're not used to dealing with a peak body, which we need to be. So it, 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 it's, we're closing the gap. But obviously RSL Tasmania has had a role as a peak body for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it correct to understand from your observations that your view is that RSL hasn't been engaging in that role previously as it's now coming to do in a way in terms of engaging with state government? I think, look, I think, I think the RSL over the last few years has very much tried to engage. But you've also got to understand the size of which RASL is. It's only a very small organisation in Tasmania. It's been made easier recently because we've got a lot of support from RSL Queensland. They now help our funding and they do a really good job of it. Uh, and there's certain people in the room that I'd like to personally thank for that. That has allowed us to fill the space more as we move forward. Uh, I don't believe that RSL's never tried to do a good job in Tasmania, absolutely has tried to do a good job, but it is compressed by funding. You know, as you know, as we spoke earlier, my budget is minus $125,000 a year. That's what it's currently running at. Now that's the case for all the sub-branches. All the sub-branches are struggling and the, the state branch is struggling too. The amount of funding we get for a peak body, although state government is trying, the amount of funding that we get as peak body is very small for a peak body. Mm. If you were to compare it to other peak bo bodies around the nation. How many um, sub-branches of RSL Tasmania are there in the state? Okay, so there are 49 sub-branches. Uh, of which 43 uh, have actually, uh, that actually operate from buildings. That, that's really important because some sub-branches don't have buildings, but there's about 43. Out of those 43, we at state own about six of them. There's about, six, there are about 16 that are owned by sub-branch and the remainder are owned by either community or local government. And um, you've raised the issue of economic viability. Have RSL sub-branches had to close in recent years that you're aware of? There has been uh, two closures of, of sub-branches in the last number of years. Uh, the first one being Glenorchy, um, uh, which was due to financial mismanagement. Uh, and the other sub-branch that, uh, that wound up was the Huon sub-branch in Huonville. And the reason why they wound up was because they weren't able to form a committee because the sub-branch members had just reduced to a point that they were not able to, to function and form a, a working committee as per our constitution. And in terms of the issue of funding, what is the distinction between RSL Tasmania and RSL Queensland in terms of having the money available to fund operations? So RSL Queensland has a, um, a fundraising arm known as the, the Art Union or the RSL Art Union. Um, and we are lucky enough to receive, receive proceeds uh, from, from that Art Union to be able to, to perform service delivery for veterans. So would it be fair to say having a self-sustaining funding model is an issue that's confronting RSL Tasmania? Yes, it is. Uh, and it's one that we have identified and it's one that we are working towards. Uh, being able to be self-supportive and self-funding um, so that we can continue to deliver the services as we, as we need to. And how do you see that being achieved? We see that being achieved through Veterans Hub. So part of our proposal, and, and there are two phases to Veterans Hub, uh, and as John um, explained earlier, the, the, the application for, for Veterans Hub has changed focus a little bit. Uh, what we look at is with phase one of Veterans Hub, it is about delivering services immediately. Uh, and that's through our, our spokes uh, and being able to put facilities in place 
to provide support to veterans. Phase two is about creating uh, an income stream for RSL Tasmania, as well as providing a centre of excellence so that we can have a location where we can provide services as well. So the, the whole concept of Veterans Hub is to, one, create an ability to generate an income, and out of that income, we can then provide the service delivery for veterans. And so that income aspect, that sort of self-funding income aspect is in phase two? Yes. Okay, that, that, that might be a, a convenient juncture for me to sort of ask some questions about. Oh, sorry, Mr. Williams, was there something you wanted to add? And, and, and you also must remember that uh, the sub-branches themselves have different funding models. So uh, it, it's fair to say that an, uh, a good percentage of the sub-branches are funded through, um, they are able to fund themselves through either the rental of floor space um, or other activities or other associations that are connected with the sub-branch as well. So, And what would those other activities be? So they, they might be a social club, they might have a bowls club connected with them. Um, they use, um, uh, for example, when I'm talking floor spaces, facilities, say meeting rooms and that, they rent out to training organisations or those type of things. So they have um, their own costs to open the front doors and they have their own funding models that they have developed to keep those doors open. And what, what about, for example, pokies? Uh, these um, very, the, the, in fact, sub-branches with poker machines in them is declining dramatically. So, if I may, uh, we've got one sub-branch that um, has poke machines uh, and uh, as an incorporated association or an incorporated organisation, um, we can't dictate to them how they generate their, their income. Um, we can provide advice uh, and support and if we can find a way that, um, with regards to poke machines, if they choose to remove those poke machines, then we will look at assisting them in replacing that funding stream so that they are still viable. But it's something that we can't dictate to sub-branches. Mr Hardy, do you have a view on um, poke machines as a means of funding the activities of ESOs in Tasmania? Look, this is a really difficult question. So this is why. So there is one sub-branch that, that has pokies in Tasmania. So we have very few if you think that we've got 43 sub-branches. We've got one that does. However, it has to be said that one sub-branch also provides a full-time advocate on the funds raised. So if we take the pokey machine, if we just go, right, get them all out, that's fine. But what will be the downstream impact of that? Because now we've got one less advocate to deliver services. I know it's not a perfect scenario. I really get that. Mm. But, you know, if you're going to take someone off an addiction, you, the worst way to do it is cold turkey. Mm. So we have to think of other ways to do that. The concept of veteran hub in phase one is to deliver services, but at the same time through a rapid build structure. So these are rapid build structures that are already in place or that we can get will take literally a week to put up. From that, when those facilities aren't being used, we have the ability to rent those facilities out. Tasmania has a unique situation, and that is it has more people coming here as tourists as it does actually people live here. So if we can rent out some of this accommodation to tourism, it basically means we can make an income. Do I think that income will be totally self-funding that everything we need to do in phase one. No, I don't, because some of these treatments are really expensive. But the more we can treat upstream, as uh, Richard rightly said, the cheaper this model becomes, because this up here, where we do sort of social intervention, is actually really cheap. And it's actually going to be done very much through a great deal of volunteer work, taking people mountain biking, even them allowed to use a veteran hub so they can get together with their mates on an Xbox, because they're in that room on an Xbox, but they're playing with all their friends from all over the country that may still be serving. That still helps their mental health. That's cheap. The, the sharp end where we get to mental illness is really expensive. And in terms of that sort of first stage intervention, what is the current cost to RSL Tasmania of those services it offers? So, like I said before, we currently we currently have a, a, a we currently have a working uh, deficit budget of about one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. 
So if I, I would have to check the figures to, to get them absolutely spot on. I appreciate that and I'm happy to give those figures later. But currently we burn about anything between about 150 dollars and $170,000 a year on providing these services. Uh, and, and again, with that, that, we need to be much more joined up how we deal with that. So for instance, State Branch has taken the hit and has hired an individual who's one of her primary roles is to facilitate grants because the sub branches can't do it. They don't understand how to make grant, grant applications. These are not easy applications. So we've taken the hit of $4,000 a month and we will employ that individual. So there's 40,000, there's $48,000 off our bottom line that we're taking the hit for because we know we've got to deliver that service to our sub branches. I want to take that a step further. That, that invitation is to all ESOs. We will help all ESOs with their grants. It's always been there and it's there now. We've only got one person, but we understand that most organizations are surviving off grants. It's not the way forward. The grant machine, is, we've got to find a better way. We believe Veteran Hub gives us a partial way, phase one. Phase two is something a little bit different and that currently has no funding whatsoever, but that is a quantum leap. Okay, well, I might, I might sort of focus back in then on, on the inception of the Veteran Hub. Um, now, you've mentioned before um, the UTAS report that was commissioned by the state and federal government and produced, I think it was released publicly in December 2021. Um, and that was at the time that the federal government announced the five million dollar funding for a veteran wellbeing centre in Tasmania, Tasmania as well as some addition, additional funding. My first question is, were RSL Tasmania consulted by the authors of the UTAS feasibility report? Mr Williams? Uh, yes, they were, but the actual consultation went out to the membership as well. So the um, engagement was to different sub-branches around their executive committees or to individual members that replied to a survey that was put out to give the information that uh, um, uh, the Veteran Hub uh, model and concept was something that was already being played with in a couple of locations in the state, um, in the north and the northwest. Um, and th th at length, we discussed how we saw that functioning in an environment where we didn't have the funding or what it is. So it was basically a grassroots comment that we've got um, where we are now and what we've done is because we've actually had assistance out of RSL Queensland with computer equipment um, and we've been able to establish a start line of our hub and spoke model that we spoke to at University of Taz. It was something that individual sub-branches were building on, um, both in the north and the northwest, and already had relationships with other um, sub-branches in their um, district and they were already starting to go. So it was a road that was already being travelled and the, uh, it was quite, and that's why um, it was brought up in that University of Tasmania survey. Um, it came out quite clear that there was activity going on at the grassroots level, um, but once we had a change of committee um, and a number of other things come out and our association with RSL Queensland, we were then able to expand that concept and get it into a place where we could start thinking about stage one and stage two and actually start delivering um, the initial start line for the hub and spokes within the state. And I know you've spoken about it a bit already, but can you just give the commissioners a brief overview of the concept of the hub and spoke model? Okay, the, the basically here in Tasmania, um, what we're looking at is two hubs, um, one in Hobart and one in Launceston. Um, when we're talking hubs, we're talking facilities that allow advocates and ESOs to work out of. Um, if we look at the Launceston hub, currently um, there is seven advocates compensation working out of there. There is a wellbeing team working out of there with um, five um, wellbeing advocates. Mates for Mates operates out there with two um, um, uh, personnel operating out of there. Um, there's facilities there that provide video conferencing, which allows uh, telehealth and stuff like that. Similarly in Hobart, there's telehealth facilities that have been developed and areas that advocates can operate in the south. 
Um, a lot of the advocates who operate in a particular hub actually have a home location, so they have a sub-branch they actually operate to, whether it's Georgetown or whatever. We've also put facilities into place into Burnie, um, which supports three advocates in the uh, Burnie, Devonport, Wynyard locations, and these people now have computer. What we have created is the initial network. Everybody's on the same um, email addresses. They have the same computer equipment, and they have computer equipment that not, a, not only a workstation and access to printers and video conferencing to enable um, some activities as Teams meetings and all those things, but they're all now interconnected and starting community practice things. So basically, it, we are working towards stage one implementation. And so, sorry, in, sorry Mr. Quinn. Yeah, I just want to um, just go back a little bit. Um, as Peter said, um, sub-branches were doing this ad hoc and independently, and there was there was no real coordination between sub-branches, uh, state branch, and there was a disconnect. And so that's one of the principles that we have looked at with regards to phase one of Veteran Hub is to, um, once again, have the collaboration between the sub-branches, the ESOs and state branch, so that everybody is interconnected, everybody's singing off the same sheet of paper, um, and we have some continuation of the services and not having individuals who are doing what they know how to do and doing it well, but not being able to connect in with other services and other organisations. And that, that, that is the heart of the Veteran Hub, is that coordination, collaboration with sub-branches, with ESOs, with state branch across the whole state. And, and, and what's supporting is these this two um, committees that we have actually developed within RSL um, Tasmania itself. We set up a, um, uh, the um, Advocacy, Welfare and Wellbeing Committee which is that it is basically, strangely enough, it has a bunch of advocates in it from across the state that talk about how we're going to implement this project. And they are not necessarily RSL advocates in that is we have peacekeepers, legacy and other representation in there. At the same time as far with the um, ESOs, um, what was set up was state, state branch was the um, ESO collaborative group and I'll allow Barry to speak to that because that is his baby. I'm the chair of the advocacy committee um, and there's, we are actually at the stage now where we're working the implementation of stage one and the planning for stage one. Mr right. Quinn. Uh, one of the requirements as I understand it, and it was before my time um, at state headquarters, uh, one of the requirements of the peak body status was for the RSL to create an ESA collaborative group whereby we would sit down and engage with other ESOs within the state. Um, and out of that collaborative group, we would then provide one voice to government and the RSL will be that conduit of that voice. Um, that was created prior, as I said, prior to my, uh, my time in, in state branch. Uh, however, we are developing we are working with the ESOs that are a part of that collaborative group. We meet um, tri-monthly, um, every three months, um, to put forward concerns that they have. So the ESOs can put any concerns that they have to that group. We can then formulate a plan and, and forward that on to, on to government. Um, so that is a committee that I am chair of. Um, and it goes back to the engagement that, that John has spoken about previously about engaging with the ESOs and collaborating. Uh, and Mr Quinn, just in terms of that committee, how many other ESOs are currently form part of that committee? So it's open to all ESOs within the state, um, whether they wish to be a part of that collaboration. It is fairly close to the 29 um, that we engage with uh, additionally. So as John said previously, when we provide information or a letter to the state government, we provide it to all the ESOs. So there's a <coughs> distinction there between you providing information to other ESOs and other ESOs electing to actively participate in that committee, is that yeah, correct? That's correct. We, we can't force the ESOs to be a part of it. In terms of active participation, how many ESOs are actively participating in the committee at the moment? Within the ESO collaborative group? Yes. There's probably about a dozen. 
Okay. ESO, but it's not also, sorry, I, I must clarify, it's not just ESOs, it's also service providers. So for example, we have representation from the Salvation Army. Uh, the Salvation Army has a dedicated um, veteran homelessness coordinator, which is actually funded um, by RSL Queensland and it works in conjunction with part of our wellness program. So we have representation from Open Arms, Salvation Army, Mates for Mates. Uh, it, it's not just ESOs, it's service providers as well. Mr Williams. And, and, and to support that last year, um, we ran a series of expos, and those expos, while being run in an RSL location um, in Hobart, uh, Launceston, up in Wynyard, um, was for all these, we invited all the SOs to participate and to come in and, and talk to veterans um, uh, uh, about the services that they provide, because the services are many and very varied. Um, and uh, so, they were proved to be very successful, 150 in Hobart, 175 in Launceston. Up the northwest coast, we had over 700 Is that individuals up. attending? What about ESOs? How many ESOs attended those? Oh, look, there would have been in excess of um, 20 service providers and ESOs. So uh, we tend to group ESOs and service providers together because they ESOs provide a service and so do individual service providers. Um, so with regards to that, and that, those three expos that we held were actually held during Veterans Health Week yep. uh, with the theme um, that is provided by DVA. Um, last year, I think it was um, fitness. Um, previous year, it was mental health. This year, it's nutrition. So what we've done is, uh, with regards to the Veterans Health Week, we, <laughs> we choose three locations around the state so that we can bring all of the service providers together. And that allows um, them to um, advise on what their services are and have a bigger reach into the veteran community. Um, and just focusing on ESO engagement, later this week the Commission will be hearing evidence from Dr Andrew Clark. Um, Dr Clark is a member of the North West Tasmania Welfare Board um, and that board is a pro proposing to establish a Defence Force Transition Centre in Burnie, I understand. Um, has RSL Tasmania collaborated with the Northwest Tasmania Welfare Board, either as part of this committee or as part of the veteran, veteran hub model? Mr. Yes. Williams? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, we have, um, and we have uh, an in, in principle as a, uh, a support, uh, an in principle agreement to support um, that project. Um, how we've actually supported that project is um, establishing um, through the support of RSL Queensland, um, three workstations, large printer, um, small printer, um, and also video conferencing facilities um, on a, basically, we want to assist you with this project and um, the advocates up there that use facilities in that location now have equipment to support their activity from our project. Will that location form part, one of the spokes in the hub and spoke model? He, 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 Mr. Hardy? Yeah, so I think, I, I just want to step back a bit. So this is this is one of the this is one of the problems. The problem is is both at state and federal level, we have to understand the best way to deliver services is the is the pebble and ripple effect. If we just throw the pebble into local areas and drop it in, we get no ripple. It only affects the local area. If we throw the pebble into the middle of the pond and it ripples out and covers the whole of the island, that's how we deliver services. We deliver services on a holistic island approach, uh, it, it, it's moving that mindset uh, away from localised support to make an all-inclusive support network across the whole island. That is, that is always going to be an issue. And it's something that we've, it's something we've got to move forward with. But we can only move forward with that if state and federal government also accept that challenge. And when we deliver veteran services, we deliver it across the whole island with an holistic approach, not piecemeal. The piecemeal approach will not work. The, the approach that will work is across the whole island. Can you just expand on the relevance of that piecemeal comment in relation to specifically the Veteran Transition Centre in Burnie? Uh, so I don't think it's just particularly for that. So I don't think it's just particularly for one particular area. 
but it, it's quite uh, it's quite common for uh, state ministers to make promises to local areas, mm -hmm. and then the local area will get some support. But if you're outside that local area, you don't get that support. So look, the veterans hub, the, the Bernie Veterans Hub idea is a great concept. It's got a really good doctor doing some really good stuff. But we need to we need to all engage. We need to bring, you know, we need them to come front and centre as well so they can help the whole of the ESO collective community work together. We need to learn from them. They need to learn from us. That's, you know, if we're going to do, if we're going to try and pilot this in Tasmania, that's how we do it. We get points of excellence and then we deliver that excellence across the island. We can't do it by just doing piecemeal pieces. And Mr Williams, you spoke about putting in infrastructure within that particular yeah. hub as part of a process of collaboration. Can you see how that work? Can you expand on how that will work as bringing it into the one model? Yeah, so, so fundamentally what we're talking about is, is existing advocates that actually are a part of that collective and work in that collective. So what we've effectively done is um, equipped um, the uh, advocate that operates in Devonport with equipment the advocate that operates in Wynyard with equipment and, and we've got equipment in burning. And then that's where we will build out to spokes in other locations, Queenstown or wherever else we go. Um, we're actually have set the state start line in pace to expand the project and to include it. The work of that particular organisation is fantastic. They've got some ideas that are deserving of support and we need to be a partner. They're another ESO organisation. Some of the members of that board are sub-branches. So the Burnie sub-branch, Wynyard sub-branch, Alveston sub-branch are a member of that, that, that group. And so you've, you've spoken about collaboration at the advocacy level. Is the ultimate goal to have collaboration beyond just advocacy, but also in terms of health and wellbeing as well? Y yes. It, and, sorry, and, Peter. Sorry, yep. if, if this is if we're, to, if we're talking about veteran hub, which we are. Yes, that is absolutely the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to put locations in local areas to deliver local services by local people to local veterans. Mm. That is that is what we're trying to do. Mm. This facility will allow all ESOs to work from that location free of charge, mm. and we'll combine their services and we'll learn together. So we start to get points of excellence. And then we'll deliver that across the whole island. That's the principle. The principle of Veteran Hub Phase One is to fix the roof. But that's all it will do. And so I take it you think co-location of services in a two structures as being critical as the first phase of rolling out that program. Yeah, we, we need to offer all the services. So just to clarify the distinction, there's an advocate compensation that looks after the DVA things, there are wellbeing advocates that look after the mental health issues and finance and whole things, there's welfare support officers, there's all sorts of other people that are in that in our organisation and then there's all the other ESOs that provide other services that are not provided for us. Uh, Mates for Mates provides a whole range of services and social um, services to assist veterans. And it's getting all those together. And once again, this goes right back into it, is that when, a, when a, we, a, we have a client come in, we have the ability to point him into other directions and services that will help him and his family to transition into uh, civilian life within, this, within Tasmania. So I think it's worth, so it's worth probably clarifying that. The purpose of a hub is to have multiple ESOs working from it. It's not a hub unless it has multiple ESOs. Those ESOs work forward with local support to the spokes. That's how it works. So a hub cannot just be purely RSL. It must have other organisations. Uh, so for instance, both locations have mates for mates. We're, we're in negotiations with Soldier On. We're in negotiations with Buddy Up. We are in negotiations with TPI to bring them into these hubs. And that's so they can operate from the hub as well, so we can learn from them. We can't all deliver the service. We have to take pieces of the service and help each other deliver the piece that we're really good at, and they deliver a piece that they're really good at. So the hub has multiple agencies working from it. If it doesn't have multiple agencies, it's not a hub. And the, uh, the other thing with this is, is we provide facilities that use, and the classic is video conferencing. So we now have video conferencing rooms that take up groups up to about 20 or so, and we're developing those across the state. 
they're to be used by other ESOs free of charge. It's not something we're going to, it's going to be charged. It's that facility is there to help them with their organisational needs. Okay. Uh, just touching upon this <coughs> model and particularly the spoke aspect of it, would it be fair to say the spoke aspect of it is delivered, it's directed rather to the geographic disparate nature of the veteran population in Tasmania? Yeah, so, uh, so when, we, when we started on this journey, and the journey hasn't been very long ago, and it is evolving all the time as we get more data, which is fantastic, particularly the census information. What we have tried to do is overlay a spoke in an area where we believe there is a higher proportion of veterans compared to other areas. So the spokes will be between about seven and nine, and the spokes will depend on funding, because a part of this funding is to put this, put this infrastructure in place. Although it will be sort of Ortec rapid build, it's not bricks and water as you know. It's a case of these establishments will be built very quickly within about 10 days, and they are cheaper. Uh, so these spokes have been overlaid on the areas where we know there is a, there are, is a higher number of veterans. However, what we've also done is where we've got more remote veterans. So for instance, the, a good example is Queenstown, uh, Zeeham uh, and Rosebury. We've put the hub, we've put the spoke in Queenstown, but that will then facilitate those two locations because it's such a remote area. The principle is that all the spokes, like several pebbles top in the water, they should ov all overlap. So they should, they should all, the wakes of the waves should all touch each other. So we've got circles that touch each other right around the island. There is areas where we can't have that because effectively there's quite a lot of Tasmania that hasn't got people in them. So where it's really remote, like Queenstown, we've put a spoke in there, but that spoke doesn't touch any of the spokes. When you look at the model, you'll see in the north, northwest, they all touch each other as they go around, and then you'll see in the south, because we've got a very high concentration of veterans in a relatively small area, there's not so many spokes there. There's only going to be two there, because there only needs to be two there, because we cover the veterans that we are. So the principle is we cover the veteran concentrations where they are around the island. We can do that because we have 43 locations to pick from to be able to do that. There's no cost in us putting, those, putting that facility on there because we already own it. So we're not buying land. We're not making big shiny buildings in phase one. What we're doing is we are facilitating veteran hub to operate beside an RSL. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, so the land, so, so the, the buildings will be built on land that's owned by RSL or its sub branches. Um, but the idea behind it is to facilitate delivery of services in a geographic disparate area. That's correct. Yeah, but in in, in fundamental, it could be a greenfield site, for example. You know that a sub branch has. It, it doesn't matter. But the big thing is what we're avoiding. We're not building big buildings. We're using existing facilities. So. We're not working on build it and they will come principle. This is about we're taking the services to the veterans in their locations. And when we set up spokes, there'll be times that we move out of those spokes. We want to be able to take our services into the veteran's home if that's where he wants to talk to us. And we can do that by establishing fixed points that we can operate out of, uh, out of these spoke locations. And at times, um, so, for example, there's a group heading off to St Helens, which is comprising a number of ESOs very soon. They'll spend four days down there, they'll make appointments, they'll tell people they're coming, and they'll say, we're in location, these are the services that you can come and talk to us about. Um, and it's happening next week in Hobart with an activity that's going on with a few people coming here. Uh, and would it be fair to say the primary focus of the veteran hub model is veterans, obviously, but is a secondary focus on their families? Absolutely, and you can ju that just goes without saying. It is on their uh, with, on their families and their extended families as well. Uh, and would you, Mr. Hutchinson, want to comment upon that in terms of the issue of mental health of veterans more generally? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's two aspects to the family that I'd I'd point out. One is that when you detach a veteran from their family, then you create more trauma on top of trauma. Um, and, and hence the uh, accommodation uh, enabling the veteran and their family to be housed. And in some cases, we may have veterans and their families who are experiencing homelessness or economic difficulty. Um, and in those cases, the veteran hub or spoke locations um, can actually be used to temporarily house families and people. Um, and 
So there's, there's that aspect to it. There's also the aspect of getting them together for treatment, but there's, there's also something that I've, I've learned um, from um, a, a friend of mine who operates um, pathofthehorse.com.au, which is a, a specialist psychotherapy equine therapy facility. And, and he's identified that by treating the whole family and bringing them to his location where he brings the entire family and looks at them together, that he identifies issues within the children who aren't medicated when the parents have already, or the veterans, or even the mothers as well, uh, mothers or fathers, depending on which, whether they're male or female veterans, um, that once they've already been had medical intervention or medical treatments, you can start to disguise symptoms, but they, he sees them in the children and has actually found that in 80% of the PTSD cases that have been sent to him by Ward 17, um, that he, he's found that the children had ADHD and he's used that to backtrack to the genetics of the, of the parents and get them, once he's removed them from their drug therapy, to be identified and diagnosed as to whether or not they have ADHD and has found that in 80% of cases where they've been resistant to PTSD treatment, they've actually been diagnosed with ADHD. But he couldn't have found that by looking at the, at the veteran. He had to look at the family because he saw it in the children. So it's very interesting. So, so bringing the family into the fold of treatment actually assists veterans from your perspective? Even diagnosis, yes. it, it, because sometimes you, you, you're seeing something reflected in the children, which is a genetic condition, which is in the parents, which is di disguised by the psychiatric drugs that they've already been prescribed because they've been misdiagnosed with, say, PTSD, which is a mental health disorder, whereas in fact they might have moral injury which is not a mental health diagnosis, mental injury being actually a, um, a condition caused by um, a conflict with your morals as a result of something that's occurred or, or that you've seen. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, from what I've been told by um, Dr. Nikki Jamieson, who's done a lot of research into moral injury and moral trauma, I believe that she's presented to the, to the, um, the commission, um, that um, 30 to 45% of PTSD cases are in fact moral injury and that the very act of treating them for PTSD results in increased trauma. And therefore we may actually be through this misdiagnosis, which is not the fault of the psychiatrists and DVA is very psychiatrist heavy. Um, psych it's like if you ask a, a carpenter to fix something, they'll find a carpentry solution, a, a psychiatrist will find a psychiatric solution. And because we don't have that tiered structure of going, you know, um, lifestyle support, um, therapeutic intervention, then medical treatment as a last resort, tends to skip to medical treatment, which tends to lead to misdiagnosis with all respect to, to medical fraternity and to psychiatrists. It, it's just difficult for them because they're put in a situation they have to diagnose. They, they can't diagnose moral trauma, it's not a diagnosis. So they diagnose PTSD. So if you, if you think of that, uh, currently at the moment, we don't have a way of dealing with this upstream before we even get there. So we can deal with all these things before we get to the point where we've got to go to that point. Actually, we might have, we might have already solved the problem instead of autom or automatically going to mental illness. If we can deal with mental health, that, that's a lot better place to be. And so phase one is obviously directed to establishing the groundwork for this upstream model. Can I turn to the question of funding for phase one? Um, now, in 2021, there was an announcement of $5 million to fund the veteran wellbeing program in Tasmania. Has that funding been allocated yet? No, it hasn't. Um, is there, has there been a process of applying for that funding? Uh, there was a consultative uh, process with um, members of the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, out of Canberra. Uh, it was a closed um, application, I guess for want of a word, whereby organisations were asked to, uh, or were invited uh, to consultative forums, um, and then from there uh, given the information to actually apply for the grant. Do you know in Tasmania how many ESOs were invited to apply for the grant? Uh, no, we do not. Um, when did that consultative forum take place? Uh, the, it took place, uh, there, were, there were numerous, uh, sorry, numerous forums that were taking place, the final one being, I believe, on the 23rd of March, uh, at which point uh, we were advised the timeframes to apply for the grant. 
uh, and uh, the timeframes that we were given uh, was that the grant had to be completed uh, within a four week period, the 21st of April. And was that an application for the $5 million funding or was it an application for funding for a business case for the $5 uh, million grant? No, that was an application, a grant application for the $5 million. Uh, we were advised that a business case uh, was not required at that time and that the six successful recipient would then have the ability to access uh, a percentage of that $5 million to create a business case. Um, and in terms of the application that you put forward, am I correct to understand that it identified the amount of monies that would be expended on capital infrastructure? That is correct. Uh, there is also operational expenditure and administrative expenditure, um, but it wasn't for the delivery of services. Okay. Uh, and I must make that clear that it, it was designed to set up a system, but not sustain the system. And in can you outline for the commissioners the breakdown in your application of spending on capital infrastructure and spending on operational and administrative services? Um, I'll pass to John for that one. I can, but I'm going to need to find the document in here. <laughs> Would it be correct to say, I, I have a figure in my head, tell me if I'm wrong about that, that it's approximately um, $3.17 million expended on capital? Uh, yeah, that would be right. And then the balance, which is approximately $1.83 million on operational costs for the first three years. That's correct. Um, so that's approximately 610000 a year in operational costs. Yeah. And if the grant, if um, you are successful in the application for the grant, obviously the capital expenditure will be on buildings on RSL property. In terms of the operational costs, Will they be distributed within RSL Tasmania or will there also be an element of distributing those operational costs to ESOs who are brought into the hub and spoke model? Yeah, so I think so I think I might have mentioned this if I'm repeating myself, I apologise. Uh, I think so we, as part of our cost, we've already included other ESOs that, we'll, that, that, uh, that we need in the space. So... For instance, if we look at Vietnam veterans, they've got their they've got their building up on Dago Point. Uh, they want to increase. They want to put another building together. This is a really good idea because effectively we can all work together. It means as part of the virtual hub, we can allocate people that can go there and and use that space, which would be really good for well-being, uh, be it as a collective. Uh, so we we put that in the bid. We've also put in the bid. Uh, things like gymnasium costs and that sort of thing because mates for mates who deal in that space uh, they would need that facility uh, so there's quite a lot of the cost that isn't us so there's also in that cost there are three uh, there are three case managers but that will allow us to give us about 24 five service so when someone comes into the virtual case space we're dealing with case managers that's that would be a communal cost because everybody's going to use the case management system. That's an absolutely key point uh, of what we're trying to de deliver with phase one. The case management system is the key. They're the people or they're the, they're the trained staff that will make sure that the veterans get the right services. So that's a really big piece. And there'll be some significant training bills with that because these people will have to deal day in, day out with some fairly serious issues. So there'll be training for that. There'll also have to be significant debrief when they, they need downtime to be able to sort of feed back some of the issues that they're dealing with it because of some of the issues they're dealing with. Uh, so there's quite, there's quite a lot of costs in there that are providing services for everybody. So although we can say, yeah, it's gonna cost $3 million to do this, this is $3 million for everybody. It's not for us. And just in terms of those operational costs you've mentioned, do you think the 610,000 across three years will be sufficient to deliver those operational administrative costs or will there be a shortfall? Uh, so as part of the model, uh, DVA, uh, and again, uh, this would be engagement that I suppose as soon as we put the application in, we would have expected straight away. So we put the application in straight away and then we went into an election which sort of made a gap. We would have expected straight away for them to come back with loads of questions so then we could have dialogue 
and, and that dialogue would then have led to how we actually make it self-funding. The principle of the self-funding in phase one is to have uh, ORTEC buildings, uh, and those ORTEC buildings, as well as providing veterinary services, will also provide veteran accommodation in emergency cases, but it will also allow us to use tourism on Tasmania as a funding stream. We, can, we, we believe we can probably get that funding stream up to about 400,000 a year. Uh, so there will be a shortfall, uh, but it won't be a 600,000 shortfall. We'll be asking for 200,000 instead of 600,000. Uh, and that's got to be the way forward of how we develop this. We're also looking at other areas within the RSL where we may need to start to restructure some of our RSL footprint in such a way that we can do accommodation and various other things like that as part of phase one. Uh, on top of that, obviously, we will put any rental yield that we get from some of our properties that we've got that we currently rent out to veterans, that will also go in the pot. So we are putting what we've got in the pot. And in terms of, so obviously in terms of the cost of what comes out of the pot, we've talked about capital expenditure, we've talked about operational costs and administrative costs. Do you have a view about across the ESOs in the veteran hub model, the cost for delivery of services? Mr. Hutchinson? Um, absolutely, and this is where, um, uh, assuming that the grant requires you to become self-funding, that's part of the wording within it, um, assuming that we take that seriously and, um, and, and take it on as a responsibility and an obligation. Um, this is where not-for-profit activity becomes essential and, and, and where we, we need to start to do business and work with strategic partners in order to actually make money, um, which is an interesting situation. It's not something that's been done before, but previously grants have been the path forward and that's how, how veteran services have been provided. But when you're tasked with becoming self-funding, or well, how do you become self-funding? Well, tourism is a great opportunity because there are 800,000 visitors to Tasmania and a population of 540,000. It is a 100% renewable location and it's a beautiful place. So it's very marketable. But our intention is to market Tasmania as a destination to the veteran populations around the world, which number tens of millions. So instead of feeding or eating into the tourism dollars of other tourism operators, we will bring our own tourists um, who, who are supporting the cause through their own tourism. And we will earn revenue from not only the tourism, but also from a range of things, including their meals, their car rentals, their flights. Um, so across the tourism spectrum, there's, there's quite a good revenue stream that we can build that will take time. But in addition, we need to actually do business. And that's where the partnership that I've developed with a company called Findex, who has 110 locations Australia-wide, and we're working towards um, implementation of um, veteran finance, where we will um, basically use their outlets in order to deliver our um, services, not to veterans, but to people that want to support veterans. And as a full not-for-profit, fully audited, where all of those revenues are spent on services, but, specifically. But in, in terms of the cost of the services the Veteran Hub model will provide yep. in a financial year, do you have an estimate about what that cost will be? It's difficult to know because we haven't ever gone upstream in this way before. And so it's not, an, and also there's 17 and a half thousand veterans that we need to engage with who we still don't have any contact details for. So we don't know their needs because we haven't spoken to them. So it, it is a, a bit of a piece of string. And so we just have to, we have to start eating the elephant one mouthful at a time. And we have, we have to start the process. So, so currently, our current operation that will cost year on year are based around a model of about 461,000. That's what we're saying it's going to be. It has to be said though, that that model was also based on, we had an understanding that we thought there was about 10 to 14,000 veterans on the island. That is now significantly higher than that. So again, at every step as we go into this, it's going to be something that evolves because we actually, we are yet to reach out and touch every veteran on the island. So that, that accepting that to be the case, that 461,000 incorporates both the cost, say, of a case manager, but also the cost of the services that are provided through the veteran hub model. Mm. The cost of some of the services. Some of the services, yeah, not yeah. all. There are, there are services yet to be 
rolled out as in identifying what the needs are. So yes. without having identified the needs, it's difficult to say what, what they will be. And some services will need to actually be developed because Tasmania doesn't yet have them. So there's no specialist veterans equine therapy facility, for example. So, so the cost is to be identified, it's yet unknown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we must work towards that and it's, it's just, what we must do. It, it's, it's, it has to be done so we find a way. And the, th and the thing you've got to note with this model is it's $400,000 or whatever the, the figure, but it is definitely value for money to deliver services in this state and it, 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 in a cost-effective way. Well, it costs $180,000 to incarcerate someone for a year. So if we keep two people out of prison, the costs are covered. So we go upstream and we, and we do what we have to do. Now, the second phase of the development is a purpose-built facility at Macquarie Point. What will that second phase add to the Veteran Hub model? John? Yeah. So, uh, so when we first started on this journey, we actually looked at this that way round. So we looked at delivering a Veteran Hub in Hobart first. Uh, as we started to look at the information and see what was available, it very quickly came apparent that actually we probably need to look at the other way around, which was to put the spokes model in first and then support with hubs. So what the hub will do in Hobart, and it, although we're using Macquarie Point as an example, we are not going to die in a ditch about where we have this location. Uh, it's not the location in theory, it's what it does. So what this will do is it will have, uh, it will have multiple uses. So for instance, on the top floor, if we use the, the model that we've got now, this will be a space where all ESOs work from. And this space will allow ESOs to work together. It will allow all the fusion that comes from that with interlocking ideas uh, and a full over overarching piece. What it does for the veteran though, is we, we will get to a position where we will be able to bring a veteran into the building and they'll be able to get a delivery of services there and then, literally walking from one place to the other so we can deal with multiple things. Veterans that are in distress have a real problem with paperwork. Uh, I have a real problem with paperwork. Uh, if we can then walk them through that, assist them through that as we take them through the journey, we can do that if we're all in one location. But it also means that mates for mates, DVA, RSL, uh, Vietnam veterans, Legacy, all those organizations are already working together. So we're handing off each other. So that's, that's the operational floor. Below that floor, we'll have accommodation. That accommodation is for emergency relief for veterans. It's also so we can bring families in because one of the facilities will be treatment. We are, still, we are now in engagement with TAS Health to see what treatment we could do on site and how we can involve doctors in that. And that's an evolving journey. But it will also allow us to uh, rent that accommodation out when it's not being used but the primary use will be to bring a whole family in to be treated. If, for instance, it's in Hobart, the family will be able to come into Hobart. So even if a veteran's got to use the hospital, they can stay in the, they can stay in the accommodation free of charge. By the way, we'll go and pick them up and we'll drop them off and we'll feed them. So all they've got to do is be ready at their residence at a set time to get on the vehicle and then we'll take them away. As part of phase one, we've got vehicles in the model because we understand with remote areas, we're going to have to go and get people. Uh, it will also deliver a service below that, and that will all be based around mates for mates. And that will also be a gymnasium. So the local community can use the gymnasium. Mates for mates will do their services out of that floor, which they do really well and far better than we would ever do. Going back up, accommodations on that floor. Above that floor, we'll have an operational space. And then on the ceiling, where we're currently looking at, there'll be a restaurant. And again, that will be a funding stream for, for actual RSL state itself. But the restaurant will do good food. So it won't be a restaurant where you're gonna get some pretty terrible burger from. It'll be a place where we can deliver good food to our veterans because we also understand that food is part of the problem. That is a, that's, that's phase two, that is not funded. But if we can do that as part of phase two and have this center of excellence in Tasmania, then that's a huge step forward because it's all there in one place. The hub in the north will still do its job. The spokes will still do its job, but then they're all supported by this, this concept where we can deliver all from one place for the people that really need it. 
But we have to understand that we need to get them people. So we have to go out and get them. We have to help them. We have to house them. And through that concept, this will slowly start to step forward and it will become a centre of excellence where we deliver good services. But because we're doing it as one organisation, that means that we can push that out through all the organisations that, that we have control over in the sense of Veteran Hub, not as RSL, which means we learn a lot quicker and we have centres of excellence around the island. Um, and can I ask, do you think this model is one that's translatable to other parts of Australia? Uh, so, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say, if we look at the Tasmanian model, we are using our advantage, and our advantage is our size and our reach, and that we are, we are a remote organisation, because we are, and therefore we can have one voice controlling what's going on around the island, feeding back all the information. And again, the Veteran Hub concept is not about RSL. So there might be key parts of this, such as the Veteran Hub up north, where they may, they'll be part of this voice and they'll say, well, actually, we need to, need to do that like that, which we understand. So we've got a key component, which is it's being able to be delivered through a central point. That would need to be, if we want to, after that pilot, we would need to decide whether that is possible to do on the mainland. So is it possible to have one simple central control node and then it dispills out through the whole island of, of Australia? Again, that, I don't think we can answer that question because actually we need to do the trial first because we may come across problems that we go, actually, when we did the trial and we did the pilot, that didn't quite work. We need to tweak that bit a bit more locally. Uh, so I think it's, it, it could be done but we need to look at the pilot first. And certainly a strong theme that's come through the evidence today that perhaps is translatable to other parts of Australia is the importance of collaboration amongst ESOs. Would you have any recommendations um, you'd make to the Royal Commission about lessons learned in terms of achieving that collaboration? Mr Williams? It, it really is about selling the, the vision. Um, to getting everybody on board um, and giving ownership. I mean, they're ba very basic principles. But the reason it's working is because everybody's got their feet at the table and we're all got the veteran and their families um, in our mind and hearts and minds and delivering services to them working together. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, sell the vision, have, uh, get everybody to have ownership in it. Um, it's not about one organisation. It's about the services that we're delivering to the veterans and their families. Mr Quinn, would you add anything to that? I think one of the fundamental things is that um, within Tasmania, most veterans are actually members of more than one organisation. Uh, and to give you an example, um, I am a member of the RSL, but I'm also a member of the Commando Association. And so you already have that cross-pollination whereby a lot of veterans are engaging with multiple organisations within themselves. So I, I think that's one of the advantages that we do have within Tasmania with our veteran community, um, that there doesn't seem to be as many prejudices between the organisations as what there is on the mainland. Uh, and the fact that you know, we are a smaller community, so therefore we do tend to work better with each other. Can that be, rep can that be replicated on the mainland? That is difficult to say, and it's because at heart, all ESOs want to look after veterans. Their methods are different, their ideologies are different, and that's why we have so many different ESOs. Mm. Uh, and, and that's the crux of problems that we don't necessarily do have in Tasmania, but we definitely are aware of, of those issues on the mainland. Finally, can I ask, are there any recommendations you would make to the commissioners in relation to addressing the issues of veteran suicide and suicidality beyond those matters that you've already touched upon today? If I can uh, just briefly identify um, the, the minister yesterday and the fact that Tasmania is lacking in uh, mental health support services specifically for veterans uh, and facilities. Um, and, and we are quite aware of uh, veterans having to be taken out of their environment, sent interstate, um, conduct an in 
inpatient program and then given a plane ticket, thanks for coming, see you later, she'll be right. Um, that, that is critical for the support of Tasmanian veterans is to be able to have that mental health support and facilities in Tasmania. Mr Hardy. Look, I think when a, when a service person joins any military, uh, they do the deeding of the government at the time. They do it well uh, and they do it with heart. But in return, we must accept that when they leave that service, it is the duty of the government of the day, be it federal and state, to ensure that that person, that veteran, can live a full and hearty life wherever they decide. They give this, we give this. It's all of our duties, not just mine or members of the board or whatever it may be. It's all of our duties to ensure that happens. We must ensure that RSL Tasmania with ESOs across the island, ensure that Tasmania is a place where the veteran community can thrive. It has a high proportion. It has a historic past, which is equal to very few. Okay, i.e. there's very few people that can equal its, its honours and awards. We can do this if we work together, but we must work together and we must leave our ego and our baggage at the door. If we don't, this won't work and we'll be having Royal Commission version 7, uh, which nobody wants. But to do it, we've got to ensure we work together. And RSL Tasmania has been very brave and I've got to say it and you know I you can tell by my voice I'm from Yorkshire I don't come from here it's been very brave and it's taken a step forward but we say it again and we'll say it now this cannot be about RSL Tasmania it is not about membership it is not about ESOs it is about the good and benefit of veterans change is constant it is the only thing that continuously happens in our lives we've got to change We've got to adapt and we've got to survive so we can provide services for our veterans. That is what this is about. Mr. Williams, is there anything you would add? No, and the big one is the ego um, and actually um, collaborative approaches will bring in the results we need in a, a very cost-effective way. We've, we've really got to change um, how we do business um, New ideas and change should be accepted and we should work together to make sure we can implement something that will continue to work as a model into the future. Mr Hutchinson. Um, I, I would say that we need to be able to engage with the veterans and I believe that the organisation that does that engagement needs to be something that doesn't have any barriers, doesn't carry any baggage. Um, is a fresh entity, which is what Veteran Hub is designed to be. Um, and in order to get that engagement, we need a what's in it for me, for the veterans, which can be in the form of incentives provided by the state government. They have a vertically integrated monopoly electricity company, for example, they could offer discounts. Actual real concessions to all veterans um, that encourage veterans to actually become engaged with the entity, assuming it is Veteran Hub, so that you can then communicate and offer the upstream services. If, if you don't give them a reason to engage, then, then they won't. And sometimes, you know, something in relation to school fees, something in relation to electricity, rates, all of these things can be incentives. They're, they're not currently provided to all veterans, um, just to be really clear about the subject of concessions that I've heard spoken about um, and I believe that that fresh entity is really key to what you were talking about before about going to a national scale as well in that if you pilot it as Veteran Hub in Tasmania and then you want to go to mainland Australia um, the entity would need to be not an ESO, not DVA, not Defence, not any of the entities that some people have barriers to because if you've got 10% of people resistant, you don't get those 10%. If you've got 20% resistant, there's, there's people who have issues with all entities. So if you start from something that's fresh, you have centralised control. Um, I've been hired to fix businesses for companies like Wes Farmers. Just try to imagine running Bunnings if every Bunnings just decided how they were going to run themselves. Um, it would be inconsistent 
and, um, and ad hoc. You need a centre of excellence where you work out how to do it, as the signs say in the back of the Bunnings and West Farmers stores. You need to know what good looks like, work out what good looks like, bring your people through the centre of excellence, train them up, replicate it across the, across the organisation. So I, I think that, that that fresh entity and a centralised operation, centralised control, no relationship to, to anything else, and a reason for veterans to actually become engaged with that entity and also that visibility that I mentioned before of actually being able to see, for a doctor to be able to see that a person is a veteran, for those medical records to be uploaded. We could do that tomorrow in relation to people who are leaving. We could do it tomorrow in relation to people who are enlisting. But then you've got the pent up demand of the people who've already gone through. How to address that issue is, 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 is a separate thing and perhaps that has to be done through financial incentives such as concessions. So I hope that it helps. Thank you. No further questions. Thanks, Commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, Mr Williams, you spoke earlier about, well, the members of the panel spoke about the need to actually engage with veterans and to do that you need to know who they are and talking about when they're leaving service, you need to know who they are. Um, and I think, Mr Williams, you talked about privacy concerns, um, that some, uh, that there were privacy concerns about um, providing information about veterans as they're leaving service. And I was just wanting to clarify whether you were referring to privacy concerns that are coming from the ADF or from veterans themselves. Uh, the good example is uh, the transition process. Uh, uh, the Army is endeavouring to make sure that everybody's known to DVA before they leave Army, for example. Uh, the churn of Army is about 5,000 um, servicemen and women each year, roughly, um, and Navy and obviously Air Force has a figure as well. Um, they, when these people transition, there is an idea of where that person is going to go after service completes. Um, it's where their furniture is going to end up, hopefully. Um, it would be of great value that as an organisation, when these people transition in Tasmania, here is the points of contact for these organisations that provide these service to support you as you transition through to civilian life. Um, to have an understanding of those numbers, it means that we can do a soft approach and send information to people, be aware this is where we are, we know you live in this state. So sorry, can I just clarify there, so are you then proposing that the Defence Force provides information to transitioning members about services in their intended location? Yes, if the privacy... Or are you actually seeking for the information for individuals? No, no, because there's all sorts of privacy legislation that won't allow that. But if the information is provided of, of what services are available and our names and points of contact, then that would alleviate the privacy issues of not knowing. At least the veteran coming to this state will have that information of where he can go to straight away. Gets off the boat, he knows where he can go to get the assistance he needs. Any family. The, the, per, the perfect scenario is actually the latter. So the perfect scenario is that we can reach out because when people leave the service, as I did and like we all did, you, you just a lot of people just leave. They just go. Mm -hmm. But if we can reach out to them and just one phone call, and I, look, I know there is privacy issues, but I'm sure there's a workaround. Uh, I know there's privacy issues of how we deal with this, but if we can make contact, if we can take that first step, it just lets them know that, hey, we're out there. Instead of just getting a piece of paper that says, oh, if you like, contact these people, these people and these people, because I'm not sure that'll work. Mm. Thank you. So my, my next question was around, you talked about essentially having to have contact with each individual or engage with each individual. Um, and I'm just thinking, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you don't know who the 20 odd thousand individuals are or where they are exactly. But if you did uh, have some way of, of gathering that information, perhaps even on a voluntary basis, um, say you've got 15,000 to 20,000 people where you're wanting to have one-on-one -on -one contact um, and, and acknowledging, as you, someone said, most people won't need much contact. But have, have you actually done the maths to work out how many 
case managers, if I can use that word, it's not case management per se, but from... Yeah, yeah. so I think, look, the, the, you know, the introduction officer, if you want to call it that, or the person that does the initial reach out, there may be multiple ways of doing that. So we, for instance, we might be able to do a, maybe something as a, simple as a burst text. So for instance, if I want to speak to my membership, I've got all their, I've got all their numbers. I can do a burst text to about 2,000 members like that because I've got that information. So we can send them text messages. That, that reach out could be a text. It's, a, it's, something, it's something that needs exploring, I completely agree. But again, if we, once, we, once we got this running and into place, it wouldn't be so, so arduous because once you've caught up, you are only gonna get a certain amount of people leaving the service. Mm -hmm. So once you've got it through the door and you've got the backlog sorted out, that number would significantly drop off very quickly. But it may need an, an additional surge the same issues they're having with trying to get people passports uh, you know we might need to put additional resources on that to do it and then once we've got it into a steady state we can reduce that but there's a lot of technology out there as well that can help us do this this may not be you know this may not be a member of staff on a phone it might be a text message because that's maybe what they want thank you and, and in phase one, in terms of the tiered services that you're talking about, it seems to me that you're not necessarily talking about having to develop all of those services. Some of those services exist now in the community. They're already funded by whatever means. Yep, exactly. Um, but what you're wanting to do is facilitate access to those services within a location. Yes, Commissioner, and, and offer, offer the services through a relationship with someone who has a single case file as a case manager so that they hand them between the appropriate services because some things won't work for some people, but we have to try. If we don't try anything different, we'll get the same results and the, and the results currently are unacceptable. So we, we have to try services for each person we might try referring somebody to bushwalking, they might hate it. We might then refer them to mountain biking and they love it. We might find that they seem to be declining at that point and we refer them to art therapy. They say, oh, I hate paint, I just can't stand it. But we find that a companion animal is perfect for them. Mm -hmm. um, it's gotta be that continuous improvement. So two I, questions arise out of that. One is, one is, do you have somewhere that, that already exists that has that current case shared case management model amongst community organisations? That's the software as part of stage one. So built into the DBA grant is the software that provides that, um, which is a system that, that we've built over seven years and, um, and we will deliver in order to handle that case management so that it's a, a secure encrypted system that allows the client to be handed between the different providers. If I may, Commissioner, we don't actually have that in place at this time. No, no, I appreciate that, yeah. Um, my second question arising out of that is, do you, do you foresee community organisations, and I'm, I guess this is the difference between ESOs, some of these community organisations that are providing the services that you will draw on are not ESOs. That's correct. correct. They're service providers of a yeah. whole range of yeah. size, shapes. Yeah, particularly in the wellbeing area, uh, what we don't want to do is duplicate services. So at times we have to get food packages. We go to the food bank. Um, we go to the Benevolent Society, we use Anglicare, we use existing services. What we don't want to do is duplicate services in areas. And, and across Tasmania, those services are provided by different organisations. Mm -hmm. So it's important that wherever our hubs are, we understand those other organisations and how we can tap in to the resources that they can provide. And that just becomes part of our package then of how we deliver these services to the, the veterans and their families. My question is, do you envisage those, you know, or representatives or, or someone from those community organisations being part of your governance model in some way? They're, Are they just part of that committee that you talked about? They're part of the, they're, they're outputs. They're output spokes for op treatment options that the case manager has up his sleeve. So we need to assess these organisations, make sure that they're veteran friendly and also veteran capable. Um, there being a difference between that's the two big, things. That's a big task. It is a big task. It is a big, this is what we have to do um, 
it, it, it needs to be done. Um, so we could say it's too big and it can't be done, but Tasmania is a great place to do it initially because it is relatively small. And okay, my final question, if I may, you said you need to work out what good looks like yep. and then you can replicate it. Yep. We already know, we, we were in Townsville for our last hearing and we visited their veteran hub and they have a completely different model to you. Yes. Um, so, and that, they'll say, we can tell you what good looks like, we're already up and running. Um, for, yeah, but it's a different circumstance. Townsville's looking after Townsville and its immediate region. We're looking after a state. There's, so, there's a huge difference between what Townsville and the Oasis Centre can provide um, within its, its field of excellence and its expertise. Okay, but the Oasis Centre doesn't reach the whole of Queensland. I accept that, but it was, the comment was offered in the, on the basis of pilot it here, establish what good looks like, and then maybe take it national. But basically what your response tells me, Mr Quinn, is that you don't necessarily think it has to be the same model across the country. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be necessarily the same model, but it's got to have the same principles. And we, and we can't quantify without actually running the program as to how it will end up and whether that can be replicated on the mainland because of the geographical differences between what we do have in Tasmania as an island as opposed to the states. Thank you. Uh, and, and obviously I'll, the other. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas. Uh, congratulations on your wish to get all the ESOs here working together to one aim. I think it's a very important thing for ESOs around the country to take on board and try to replicate. I'll betray my background now by asking what thought you've given to any legal structure you might set up to carry this veteran's hub forward. I gathered from what you said, Mr Hutchinson, that you were thinking of a new entity. Is that a, a company um, delivered by guarantee, perhaps? Potentially a company, potentially a not-for-profit. Um, I, I, there, there do appear to Who be- Who would be the members? Well, at this stage, because the grant funding is by RSL Tasmania. Um, now, how would you accommodate the interests of other ESOs? Would you ask them to be members or would you enter into a memorandum of understanding? It, would be, of yeah. it would be by uh, memorandum of understanding. And are they what you're negotiating now with a number of the ESOs? Yes. We're and not, what, sorry, we're not negotiating MIUs at this point in time. We are in discussions with the ESOs. Uh, and we are well, looking at... Well, it's a preliminary to an MOU, can yes. I yes. ask that? Okay. How many of them are positive? I think the majority of, of ESOs okay. across the island are, are, are positive and encouraging. I, I suspect a lot of what is, in, is facing you will be refining the detail of agreements like that. Um, are yes. you confident in the way forward? Well, I think part of it is that, as we spoke about earlier about what is an ESO and certification of an ESO. Um, it's not necessarily possible that all ESOs can participate because some ESOs have two members. So I tend to think that yes. it's the major ESOs that provide effective services without any disrespect to any organisation. They're all important and doing an important thing, but you, there has to be a cutoff at some point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me try to clarify something I've tried a couple of times to find out more about before is the legal structure of the RSL overall. Am I correct in thinking that a, an individual, a veteran, would join, say, a sub-branch or a branch uh, as a oh, member of the sub-branch or branch? Right person, yeah, so normally a veteran would join a, a sub-branch as a member. And would the sub-branch be typically an unincorporated association? No, all of our sub-branches are incorporated. Okay. And, and Under the State Association and Corporation correct. Act? Now, the sub-branches, are they the members of the Tasmanian RSL? Yes, they are. And does the Tasmanian RSL have control over what uh, their constitutions look like? Yes, we do. Their, their constitutions are a bylaw of our state constitution. So why is it that you can't control how this one particular sub-branch uh, generates its income? We don't have the authority within our constitution to dictate how they raise their funds. Okay. Right. Perhaps that could be changed? Perhaps it could be. I don't know. Um, 
You know, Mr Hardy in particular, you retired from the military in Britain. Do you have any experience of the ESOs in the UK and how they compare to them here? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. When I, retired from, when I retired from the UK military, I went straight into the uh, into private sector uh, and did. Uh, I completely set my life up, which was basically I was fortunate. I was, you know, I had a good career. It, they trained me. They prepared me. I left the military. I then went into the private sector initially, then into the corporate world, uh, and sort of uh, and ran my life. Uh, sure. and, and I'm I'm very fortunate. Uh, so that's part of our terms of reference. Yeah, require us to consider how. Mm. The issues we're looking into are dealt with in other countries like the UK. Yeah. So I thought you might have been a useful source of information. One of the things that John has mentioned is in relation to an organisation called the Union Jack Club, which operates something similar to Veteran Hub Phase 2. I see. Which is um, food and accommodation, which they do for generation of revenue, and you can't get a table or a room from the way that it's been described to me. Right. Um, which ties into the to the to the veterans from other countries is that right John yeah, yeah that's correct so the, the the Union Jack Club is a major establishment in London provides services uh, and it's very veterans it's very veteran centric uh, I mean that was that was a con that's one of the reasons why we came up with the accommodation part of the spectrum because we know that there's a whole military organizations all over the world there that we could bring tourism in through that as well okay. uh, mr. Quinn there was one step in the structure of the RSL I committed, would the state branches be the members of the national branch? The national, uh, RSL Australia? Yes. Con consists of the national president and the seven states and territories. Right, thanks. So, yeah, it's, it's the state. And does each state branch have equivalent rights, as it were? How do you mean? Well, as if you are, for example, representing RSL Tasmania on RSL Australia, would you have one vote? Compared yes. to one vote for New South Wales, one for Queensland? Yes. Okay. And finally, um, as I understand it, the Queensland RSL has a significant income from its art union, which, for example, assists the RSL here. Um, was there at one stage a proposal that that art union be run nationally? Uh, I'm not aware of that, and that's a question you would have to ask RSL Australia and RSL Queensland. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for Mr Hardy. Uh, Mr Hutchinson mentioned a bit earlier today that in your experience in the UK, if you had gone presented yourself at a medical centre or a hospital or whatever, they would know you're a veteran. Can you just expand on that? Are you able to expand on that? Uh, and the reason I'm asking before you tell me is that we've been struggling with how we may recommend that veterans you know, can be kept the tab on to, to work out where they go, um, and particularly in relation to their treatment for medical issues. Yeah, look, I think uh, I didn't know. So the first time I went to a uh, doctor in the UK, which was some years after leaving the military, so it wasn't sort of the next week, it was literally five years later, they knew I was a veteran. Uh, and when I asked them, and I was sort of taken back, I sort of did go, how do you know that? And they said it was part of a it was part of a record transfer that they had received that I was a veteran. It was something that was done automatically. You didn't well, it, initiate it, it. It must have been because it definitely wasn't me, and I hadn't been in any medical facility since I left the military. So I, I don't know whether it's something they do straight away or they do after a certain amount of time. I, I don't know that if that's the answer or not. But they definitely have my details. Thank you. It, it may be somehow the equivalent of Medicare is connected to veteran services, which is something we're going to have a look at, certainly. Yeah. And as uh, Commissioner Douglas mentioned, our terms of reference oblige us to examine what's happening in the Five Eyes nations, mm. uh, US, UK, Canada and New Zealand. So we'll be doing that. Um, just one last question for Mr Quinn. We, we, we believe that there's somewhere between 3,500 up to seven or 8,000 um, ESOs around the country. Yeah. I know we've discussed this today in, in, in many ways, but as a, as the president of a state branch, you know, if you if you uh, have informed us that the last survey you conducted in 2019, the average age of members who were surveyed is 72. I'm, I'm just not sure how we move forward in, in terms of trying to get some unity, um, collaboration, cooperation across the country. You can imagine that if you could galvanise those three and a half thousand or more organisations to speak with 
one voice um, or close to one voice. You'll never get absolutely everyone, of course. But you, I'm sure you've thought about this at some stage. What would you do nationally? I think there needs, uh, in the first instance, to be a code of conduct. And um, there, there are industries that have industry standards. Uh, whether so they it's be governance? Certain, is are you suggesting governance? 100% governance. Um, yeah. There needs to be transparency, honesty, honesty and openness. Um, there are a lot of ESOs and a lot of organisations that are self-serving. Um, and most veterans will come across at least one organisation that is like that. Um, so I, I think governance, code of conduct, potentially a um, accreditation um, is, is a start. So that if you have an organisation, you must have at this level at a minimum to be considered an ESO and be collaborative. If you're not prepared to work with other ESOs and other organisations, um, the question will be asked, why don't you, or why won't you work with other organisations? In, in, in justifying that they actually are providing services that are delivering outcomes to veterans and their families is a must. If they're not, then they shouldn't have that accreditation as a ESO. But, um, just bearing in mind that some of them may not, and we understand quite a lot of them, are not actually seeking or have ever had funding. It's simply a, a social activity, which is, I'm sure is good. They, they get together. And yeah, I understand that, but there's still a code of conduct that can be upheld, even if it's just a social standard. Um, you know, there, there has to be something that, I guess, if, if you had that in place, that would be the first mechanisms that the ESOs are on a level playing field. If they, if they prescribe to that in the first instance, regardless of what their outcomes or their aims or their objectives are, if they at least sign up to a code of conduct or an accreditation process, then that's a start. And then they can then look at and go, right, yeah, well, okay, how else do we improve? Thank you. Thanks, gents. Mr. Dyson, any questions? No. Ms. Cullen, any questions? I think she may have dropped out. <laughs> okay. Uh, any matters arising, Ms. Longbottom? Nothing further. Thank you, Commissioner. May the witnesses please be excused. You're excused from your summons to attend. Thank you for your evidence today. Thank you for all you do for veterans, and we wish you every success. Thank you. Um, if there's no other matters, we'll adjourn for lunch. All rise. The Royal Commission is adjourned until 2 p.m.
Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide has resumed. Please be seated. Good afternoon, Ms Bridget. May it please the Commission. Commissioners, before the witnesses are affirmed, there are two matters I would like to attend to. Before I do that, I'll just mention that Sophie Callan, just before the lunchtime adjournment, uh, Commissioner, you asked whether there were any further questions and she didn't have any questions, but just the message is, is that she'd lost connection. We, we worked that out. Yeah. Well, thank you, Commissioners. So the two matters I would like to attend to. The first matter, Commissioners, relates to the nature of the evidence this afternoon. As Senior Counsel stated in the opening address, this afternoon you will hear from four witnesses about the high rates of poor mental health suicidality and suicide amongst the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, asexual plus communities. I will use the acronym LGBTIQA plus for those communities. Commissioners, in the Sydney hearings, you heard evidence from lived experience witnesses, former serving members of defence and how they were treated when their sexuality was disclosed. The Australian, government, the Australian Government's National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Plan acknowledges that people from these communities have high rates of suicidality and suicide. The National Suicide Prevention Advice, Advisor's Final Advice, which was published in December 2020, identified that these communities as a priority population and recommended targeted approaches to suicide prevention for, these disproportionate, for those disproportionately impacted by suicide. Defence is a foundational member of Pride in Diversity, Australia's first and only not-for-profit organisation of an employer support program for all aspects of LGBTI workplace inclusion. Given the nature of the evidence this afternoon, commissioners, it may be triggering or distressing for some people especially for people from the LGBTIQA plus communities. I raise this now, Commissioners, to afford those who may be triggered or distressed the opportunity to not listen if they so wish, or to reach out and seek support. And just on that, Ms Bridget, we've said this a couple of times, but it bears repeating. If anybody is struggling with the evidence that we're about to hear, please know we do have here um, counselling staff make yourself known to them. Um, they have the orange lanyards and they can help by talking to you about whatever you're feeling at the time. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioners, the second matter relates to one of the witnesses, Professor Noah Reisman. Professor Reisman is attending the hearing today from Germany by video link. Because he is overseas, he is not attending under a summons. He is attending voluntarily and he will therefore not take the oath or the affirmation. On that note, I ask that the three witnesses, Associate Professor Bourne, Joe Ball, and Anna Bernasocki be affirmed. Adam Bourne, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Joe Ball, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Anna Bernasocki, do you solemnly declare that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Operator, please display the tender bundle list. Commissioners, the tender bundle list contains 30 documents that have not been previously tendered. It also contains some documents that have been previously tendered. But I, I tender the documents that have not been previously tendered as per that tender bundle list. Thank you. Um, they'll be accepted into evidence and allocated the next consecutive numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Associate Professor Bourne, can you please tell the Commissioners your full name? 
It's Adam Hughborn. And you are the Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society at La Trobe University, Melbourne, Australia. Is that correct? That's correct. And at the Australian Research Centre, you lead the LGBTIQ Health Research Program that examines the health and well-being of those populations. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And the research program includes projects relating to population level health, family violence, alcohol and other drug use and mental health. That's correct. And you have been the lead investigator for a number of research projects and studies. Relevant to your evidence today, you were the lead investigator of writing themselves in four. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were the lead investigator for Lean On Me. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were the co-investigator in the study Private Lives 3. Is that correct? That's correct. And you are also a senior visiting fellow at the Kirby Institute, University of New South Wales. Yes. And in tw January 2020, you were appointed to the Victorian Whole of Government LGBTIQ Task Force and serve as the co-chair of its Health and Human Services Working Group. Is that correct? That's correct. And you have researched and published widely on suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts among LGBTIQA people. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Thank you, Associate Professor. Professor Reisman, can you please tell the commissioners your full name? Noah Jed Reisman. And just to correct something you said earlier, I'm not in Germany, I'm in Sweden. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor, in Sweden. Um, and Professor, you are a Professor of History at the Australian Catholic University, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. You have a PhD <clears throat> in History and Australian Studies from the University of Melbourne. Correct. And you have authored and co-authored a number of books. And relevant for today, you have authored, co-authored Pride in Defence, the Australian Military and LGBTI Service since 1945. Correct. And Serving in Silence, Australian LGBT Servicemen and Women. Yes, correct. And you have also authored and co-authored books on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experiences in the military in Australia. Is that correct? And Correct. you have published widely on the history of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex service personnel in the Australian Armed Forces post Second World War. Correct. Thank you, Professor. And is it fair to say that your research is predominantly focused on the histories and experiences of marginalised social groups in Australia in the 20th century? Correct. And you have been awarded a number of teaching awards, including the ACU, which is Australian Catholic University, Vice-Chancellor's Excellence in Teaching Award in 2015. Is that correct? Correct. Mr. Ball, can you please tell the commissioners your full name? My name is Joe Ball. And you are the current CEO of Switchboard Victoria, is that correct? That is correct. You have led the establishment of the world's first LGBTIQA plus family violence, suicide prevention and mental health system navigation helpline known as the Rainbow Door. Is that correct? That is correct. And you delivered a keynote address at the International Association of Suicide Prevention. That is correct. You also spoke at the Roses in the Ocean Lived Experience of Suicide Summit. That's correct. And, Mr. and Ms. Bernasocki, can you please tell the commissioners your full name? Annabelle Bernasocki. Thank you. And you are the Suicide Prevention Manager for Switchboard in Victoria? That's correct. And you correct. are the co-investigator of the LGBTIQA plus lived experiences of suicidal distress using Indigenous co-design principles. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you're also the research lead for the research project on LGBTIQ plus postvention at the University of New England. Correct. And in 2021, you were, the peer, you were on the peer advisory group for the research project Lean On Me. That's correct. And you sit on a number of advisory boards and working groups, is that correct? That's correct. And in, from 2019 to 2021, you were involved in the LGBTIQ plus Suicide Prevention Trial Task Force, part of Northwestern Melbourne PHN, which is part of the National Suicide Prevention Trial. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. 
Professor Reisman, I might start with you, and before I start asking you some questions about your research, on the 4th of November 2021, you provided a submission to the Royal Commission. Is that correct? And correct. you would like to make some corrections to your submission. Operator, please display sub.0000.0004.0003 and Professor Reisman, I'm not sure if you can see that in front of you. Yep, and yes I can. And you recognise that as your submission? It looks like it, yes it does. And on page 0034 at the top, in point one there, is that sentence correct? No, where it says Chief of the Defence Force issue a public policy, that is an error on my part. It should say public apology. Thank you. We'll accept that correction, Professor Reisman. And Operator, if you could please go to dot zero zero four five. And again, in that recommendation one there, is that correct? Uh, same error there. I believe we're... Sorry, yes, at the very top, issue of public policy, again, should be public apology. Thank you, Professor. And Operator, if you could please go to 0051. And just in the sentence above options there, Professor Reisman, is that correct? Sorry, which sentence am I looking at? I think that may be correct there, Professor Rise. Yeah, that looks fine to me. Thank you. Can you please tell the commissioners the aim or aims of your research into the history and experiences of the LGBTI service personnel in Australia and what it involved? Sure. So the project began as sort of pilot research in 2014, and from 2016 through 2019, we were funded by an Australian Research Council Discovery Grant. Um, I was the project lead. The other investigators were Associate Professor Shirlene Robinson, who at the time was at Macquarie University, and Dr. Graham Willett, who was at the Australian Queer Archives. And our project aimed to explore the changing policies, practices, and lived and living experiences of LGBTIQ plus defense members from the end of the Second World War through to the present. For the research, we did a mix of archival research along with oral history interviews. In the end, interviewed 140 um, LGBTIQ plus defense members, past and present. About 60% of them were, were ex-service members and about 40% were currently serving at the time of the interviews. And as I mentioned, archival research, so went into the National Archives of Australia and explored any records we could find, we could find relating to sexuality, transgender in defense. So there was a lot of policy material, especially pre-1992 um, when the ban was lifted. Um, so policies about the ban on homosexuality and documents relating to the lifting of the ban. Interviewed a small number of politicians and commanding officers, past and present, um, about their experiences involved in this space. A small number of allies, um, such as family members of deceased defense members, and also went through old media, both the mainstream media and the LGBTIQ plus media, which was kept at the Australian Queer Archives. Thank you, Professor. And can you please tell the commissioners what you found just in terms of the policies? If you could just give a quick, perhaps, overview of the policies and how they changed. Sure. So before the Second World War, um, obviously, there was, it wasn't that homosexuality was accepted in the forces, but there wasn't any explicit policy on it. The first explicit policy on homosexuality came out during the Second World War. And what it said was that in any cases of suspected homosexuality, there would be a bit of an investigation. And it was treated somewhat medically at the time. Um, and if someone was found to be sort of a confirmed homosexual, to use the language, they would have to be discharged. Um, whereas if it was someone who was seen to just be, you know, having a one-off, let's say, um, just a, an incident, then they could be retained in the forces. You see very similar policies come in after the Second World War. But for the most part, based on the oral history interviews, we found that, that often a blind eye was turned when it came to male homosexuality in the period from the end of the war until the early 1970s, so long as the person was discreet. If they weren't discreet, 
then that same policy was followed where the person would be investigated and they would go through a process and then they would have to leave the defense force. Women during that period, however, it was very different. Women were always being targeted. That's one thing that's, that's been very clear from the research from both the Second World War and after is that they were always targeting women. If they were found to be in a same-sex relationship, they were forced to discharge. The first time you get a tri-service policy, a consistent policy, is in 1974. And that policy was much more detailed. And what it said was any case of suspected homosexuality had to be referred to the respective service police. The service police were then authorized to investigate. There were supposed limitations put on what the service police could do in their investigations, but there were such um, vague loopholes, let's say, that the service police were doing a lot more than what was uh, originally intended. So, um, for instance, service police would do secret searches. They would send undercover service police into gay and lesbian bars. Uh, people were questioned sometimes in secret. Once enough evidence was gathered that a person was was seen to be gay or lesbian, they would then be called in for an interview um, based on the oral histories. And also you would have seen this from the testimonies Yvonne Sillett and Danny Liversidge gave a few months ago. These were often harrowing experiences. I think the word interrogation is a much better word than interview. And usually during that process, then a person would, would crack essentially. And they'd be, under the policy, they were given two options. They either could request their own discharge, which would be administrative, and it would at least be honorable, or they would be given a dishonorable discharge services no longer required. Not surprisingly, the vast majority of people accepted the former option. The ban on gay and lesbian service was lifted in November of 1992. And after that, the, there was no policy at all, really. Um, I mean, on the plus side, people couldn't be kicked out, but there wasn't necessarily anything about about anti-discrimination, about anti-bullying, anti-homophobia. There wasn't recognition of same-sex couples in most areas of defense. There were a very small number where there, there, were, there was some limited recognition. Um, so during the period from about 1993 till 2005, I usually say it was a period of tolerance at best. And you begin to see that change at the very end of 2005 when the policy was changed to, to recognize same-sex couples within defense for, for, all, for all purposes, same-sex de facto couples. And that sort of ushers in the beginning of a new era, which from 2006 onward, I, I tend to refer to as the era of inclusion, where defense started to, to not just tolerate LGB people, but went out of its way to, to start trying to include them. And you see more changes in practices over the years until about 2017 around inclusion. I think we're still in that era, but and we'll probably come to this later. I would say that from 2017 till till earlier this year, defense in many ways kind of went quiet on the inclusion agenda. Um, I think for political reasons. Um, the one thing I just extra add to that, I know I'm talking a lot, is just um, transgender service wasn't usually talked about in the policies when it came to transgender people um, before 2000. Often they may have been dealt with under the same policies as homosexuality. Sometimes it was seen as a medical issue and they would be discharged medically. Um, in at least one case that we know of, a very senior officer who came out as trans was allowed to serve quietly for a few years till that person reached 20 years of service. In 2000, there was a formal policy brought in on trans service that said that if a person wanted to affirm their gender to transition, then they would have to leave the defense force. Um, supposedly they could come back after they transitioned, um, anecdotally, or we do know that of at least one person that that happened, but more often than not, that was not the case. That ban was lifted in 2010, September, 2010. And so trans people have been allowed to serve since 2010. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Associate Professor Bourne, you have undertaken extensive research into the health and well-being of the LGBTIQA plus communities. Operator, please display exp.0006.0011.15 And this is a presentation that you have done, is that right? That's correct. And if you could go to operator, please, 1537. And so before I ask you about some of the findings of your research, I thought we might start, if you can please provide the commissioners with an overview of the various ways that people can identify with respect to sex, sexuality and gender. 
Of course. So this is a slide I often use at the start of presentations as a bit of a LGBTIQ 101 to help people ensure that we're all on the same page before we have, before we present the rest of the findings. So if we start with sex, that's shown there on the left-hand side, really what we're referring to there is the kind of the mechanics and the building blocks of our body. So our physiological features, our organs, our hormones, uh, and our chromosomes. People are assigned a sex at birth, um, most commonly being assigned, a, being assigned male or female with an XY or an XX chromosome. It is possible though to be intersex, to have one of more than 50 different variations in your chromosomal makeup, which means that you don't display um, normatively, uh, um, you don't express char sex characteristics that are normatively male or female. So sex characteristics being things like your genitals, for instance. Um, if we like, turn to sexuality, um, that broadly relates to your attraction to other people. Uh, everyone has a sexuality. Um, the most common sexuality, of course, um, is heterosexual. Other terms that people may be more familiar with um, are gay, lesbian, um, denoting an attraction to someone of the same sex or a bisexual person, someone who's attracted to both men and women. There are other terms that you can utilize here as well. Pansexual is an increasingly utilized term, and that really just denotes someone who is attracted to anyone regardless of gender. Um, gender itself refers to the kind of, the, it's how we think about ourselves, and it refers to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions, and identities. It influences how people think about themselves and how they act and interact, what it means to be a man or a woman and what that means about how you present yourself to the world and how you behave. Often, we're, we, we're like, like sex, we're used to thinking of gender as being a binary, you're one or the other. Um, it is, in fact, a continuum and it can change over time. People can also be non-binary. And they can be gender fluid or they can exhibit a range, they can, sorry, utilize a range of other terms that denote uh, gender diversity. You can affirm your gender identity in a whole range of ways, in the way that you present yourself and the way that you dress, the way you style your hair. And a kind of key feature in affirming gender identity is the pronouns that someone utilizes. So I would use he, him pronouns. Um, someone who identifies as non-binary might utilize they, them, for example. Um, if you identify with the same gender that you were assigned at birth, you can be described as cisgender. So I was identified as male at birth, I still identify as male, so I, I can be described as being cisgender. That's a term that you'll, use, you'll hear a few times today. If you're someone who identifies with a different gender to that you were assigned at birth, you can be referred to as transgender or trans or gender diverse. That, again, that's another term that comes up quite a few times. And just the very last term to kind of have your head around um, is queer. Um, queer is, can be both a singular and a plural, so someone can be queer as an identity, and it can also be used to refer to the broader collective or community of LGBTIQ people, the kind of rainbow community more broadly. Um, and it broadly denotes someone, um, it broadly denotes a non-heterosexual or non-cisgender identity. That's kind of what we mean um, in utilization of the term queer. I should also have up on the screen, and forgive me that it's not there, um, the term asexual. An asexual is a person who doesn't have sexual feelings or desires. That's what we're referring to as asexual. And in the acronym, that uh, you'll see a plus. What does the plus stand yes, for? Yes, so the plus really is there. It's a, it's a bit of a catch-all for all of those other terms where the letters aren't represented. So I already mentioned terms like pansexual, non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer. These are other terms that people within the community do utilize, less commonly so perhaps. And so the plus is there to represent, reflect the fact that there are other ways that people can talk about themselves in sexuality and gender diverse ways. Thank you. And Mr. Ball and Ms. Bernasocki, would you like to introduce Switchboard? And also, would you like to add anything to what Associate Professor Bourne has said about identities? I, I, did you want to add anything about identities? I mean, I think the main thing to say about identities is they change over time, they're not fixed. Um, and that some of the terminologies that people come to um, can be uh, 
relational to their exposure to the community. And of course, they're different in different cultures. So in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, trans and gender diverse people or, or people of maybe third gender would be referred to as brother boys and sister girls. Um, you know, there's in, uh, you know, American communities, it, people who are transgender are called two spirits. And of course, all those people live in Australia and all those identities can exist in Australia and be used um, and also young people take on new identities that they create and they adopt um, internationally. And um, so some of the terminologies you've been introduced to today are some of the more common ones. Um, and that sometimes people around identities are pejorative about the idea that the alphabet is long, but in the LGBTIQA plus community, the alphabet is something we have of pride and not something to be made fun of. And actually we take it as a part of our cultural being is that we are always looking to include more people. If there was a cultural characteristic of being part of the LGBTIQA plus community, it'd be one of seeking to include. And that's what we're doing with the plus in the alphabet. Um, and also, of course, people in our communities reject labels. Some people will be men who have sex with men, women who have sex with women. They engage in sexual activity that aligns themselves with the LGBTIQA plus community. And you see that in some of the evidence, evidence given in the Royal Commission is that the first time someone was ever heard a terminology as lesbian might have been an allegation that was put to them by a commanding officer. But prior to that, they may have talked about being in love with someone. So labels are something you don't always have access to. Um, you don't all, always have awareness to because you may not be connected to a broader community or you might also reject them. Um, and I think that just gives you an overview. Now I'll go on to talking about what is Switchboard, right? Um, so Switchboard was established in 1991, commissioners. Uh, we are an LGBTIQA plus community controlled organisation. And this means that everybody who works, volunteers and sits on the board needs to identify as part of our community. As our name suggests, we started out as a helpline for the LGBTIQA plus community. And 31 years on, we are still providing this service. Unfortunately, the calls we received then are still the ones we receive today. People in our community call when they are in suicidal distress, struggling with anxiety and depression, want to talk about coming out, experiencing family rejection and workplace discrimination, having crises of faith and rejection from their faith communities and experiences of loneliness and isolation. Mr. We have Mr. always Ball, spoken to, to those just ask love. you to just slow down for the transcript recorders. Uh, Thank you. Please continue. Sure. We have always spoken to those who love and support our community, and this has always included speaking to parents, workmates, community leaders, and we've provided secondary consultation to mainstream service providers. Our service today has expanded beyond one helpline, and we run QLife in national partnership, a seven day a week single sessional support line, which I'd make a comparison to that to Lifeline. And today we run the Rainbow Door, Australia's first and only family and domestic violence service for LGBTIQA plus people, which is not service, but first helpline. We connect people experiencing violence and suicidal distress also on the Rainbow Door with the, support, with the supports they need. We also run a program for older LGBTIQA plus people, an anti-racism project, and importantly, for today's purposes, we run a dedicated national suicide prevention service. We run a national network of LGBTIQA plus people with a lived experience of suicide, which informs all of our suicide prevention work. And the network is often called upon by government and organisations to contribute to co-designing suicide prevention initiatives. We provide postvention support, including bereavement groups, resources on how to respond to a suicide and secondary consult to communities bereaved by suicide. Next month, I'm pleased to let the Commission know that we'll be launching our online national resource hub, Charlie. We also provide training in suicide intervention skills 
and how to work with our communities who are, who are in suicidal distress. I want the commissioners to know that our service has always been open to LGBTIQA plus service personnel and veterans. And according to our 31 year call logs, they have been ongoing service users. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ball. Um, Ms. Bernasocki, did you want to add anything about uh, the issue we were raising before about identities? No, I think that's well covered. Thank you. Thank you. Associate Professor Bourne, before you undertook your research, and we'll get to that in a moment, what was known about the data regarding mental health, suicidality and suicide for these communities? Where did the data come from, if there was any data at all? Sure. Look, um, Australia, not dissimilar to other countries, I suppose, tracks mental health and suicidality in a variety of ways. So as you, you know, as the commissioners will be aware, there's data collected by organizations like the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Institute for Family Studies, who can conduct cross-sectional or longitudinal studies to understand suicidality and mental health. They also collect data in a variety of administrative systems, so things like hospital records, ambulance call-outs, um, and data from the coroner or coronial data. Um, the key issue is that in each of those cases, um, LGBTIQ people aren't especially visible, and that's for a range of reasons. Either data about gender diversity or sexuality simply isn't collected in those surveys. They never ask the questions, and I'm afraid that has been the case in, an, in a very large number of instances. Um, sometimes the data is collected, but it's not disaggregated, so there's no way of knowing or understanding what the experience looks like for, um, for different sections of the population with respect to sexuality. Um, or in some instances, the data is collected, but there's an insufficient number of LGBTIQ people to enable that kind of disaggregation. It's just too small a number to be able to make a meaningful comparison. And so what we've been more reliant on um, is what's often referred to as community surveys. So surveys that are directly targeted at LGBTIQ people to try to understand their mental health and suicidality related experiences. And those are the ones that our center has been involved in um, for quite some time. And Associate Professor, do, does the coroners collect any data regarding the communities? Uh, I'm afraid I'd only be familiar with that at the Victorian level, but I, my impression is that it's replicated in other states and territories. The, the short answer is no, it's not, it doesn't form part of standard administrative collected data from the coroner. There have been efforts more recently to, to undertake a narrative review of coronial records to try to identify individuals who have um, suicided as to whether or not they may have been LGBTIQ, but it's a very imperfect process. This is a, a, an, a, an, an ongoing and very live discussion, I would say. And the census? Does the census ask any questions about sexuality or gender? The census does not ask any questions about sexuality or gender. A recommendation was made by the Australian Bureau of Statistics to include such questions in the last census, but that was not adopted by the previous government. Thank you. And Mr. Ball or Ms. Bernasocki, would you like to add anything about data? Yes, thank you. Um, firstly, I would like to you know, say that I echo um, what I've heard Adam say, um, but also bring to the commission that there is emerging data that is more qualitative in nature, that explores what the experiences are for LGBTIQA plus people who are in mental distress or experiencing suicidality. And when we're looking at qualitative data, it can often tell us more than population-based data can, because it can offer us information around how to offer meaningful support that can reduce suicidal distress. It can tell us about protective factors. It can tell us about community connection and belongingness and what thwarts those processes. Um, so the existence of qualitative data, especially in suicide prevention, is as meaningful as population-based data. But the population-based data is, it's really vital. It gives us a picture of how widespread the problem of suicide is in LGBTIQA plus communities. Um, and as uh, 
Adam has mentioned, that the coronial reporting around LGBTIQA plus suicide deaths is something that in Victoria in particular we're working on at the moment, particularly with the LGBTIQA plus commissioner's office. Um, and in a month's time, the first report that is narrative-based will be released, which is retrospective data. So a process has been looking at perennial reports searching for mentions of LGBTIQA plus people who have died by suicide. And this is an imperfect process because like our, our medical systems, such as hospitals, as well as um, I guess services and programs, the question of whether someone is LGBTIQA plus gets. And wherever that question isn't asked, we don't have that. Ms. Bernasocki, I'm sorry, but you are cutting, um, you are cutting in and out, and um, so you might want to move closer to your microphone in that in the in the room there. Thank you. Did you want to add anything more to that? Uh, yes, I have one more point to make. Um, so, in 2015, the Human Rights Commission um, has highlighted that there's an underrepresentation of LGBTI First Nations people in health and wellbeing research. Um, and much of the research around LGBTIQA plus suicide and mental health, um, lots of, I guess, the health literature has been focused on sexual health. So I think there's been much more of an emphasis in recent years toward understanding suicidality in the populations in Australia, um, but it's definitely what we consider emerging research. Thank you very much. If I could add... Yes, Mr Ball. Um, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add something about the census is just to say also the fact that it has been another census where they haven't included these questions impacts the longitudinal study of our communities. So the next census hopefully will be the first census, but it means that there will be no comparable census data. Um, it will be the first um, and, it, and that will take a period and it will only be successful I believe, in my opinion, it will only be successful if there is a funded campaign to make people aware of how to complete the question correctly. Um, and that needs to, because of English as a second language and people's lower literacy around LGBTIQA plus questions, so there needs to be um, an enumeration strategy of the ABS funded to look at how the data can be best collected on the census um, and, and also the thing about the census is that it creates a baseline, which is important for suicide data collection, because if we don't know the sheer number of our community and where they are in Australia, we can't properly measure prevalence because we can't measure it. There's no baseline. We're, me we're measuring it off an estimation of how many people we think are in our community and how many people have suicidal stress against the potential and optimistic uh, coronial data that may come. So I would say we are in a data deficit in this area. Um, and uh, that means, you know, that is a, a major challenge. Thank you. And Professor Reisman, did you have any comment or did you want to add anything to what was said about data? Really quickly, I will say one thing that's intriguing is even though the, Austra the ABS big census doesn't collect this data, the Australian Defence Force census does have questions about sexuality and gender. So it is actually available in the ADF census st statistics, uh, certainly the most too recent. I, I don't remember what year they started collecting it, but it's definitely in the 2015 and the 2019 data, people who answered the question about whether they're same sex attracted, attracted to both sexes, and whether they identify as transgender, that's in the ADF census. And I guess the other one is just in terms of where this fits with my research, just historically, for similar reasons, um, going back further historically, all we can do is qualitative research, the oral history interviews, the anecdotes, um, in, in, in part because people who died by suicide for reasons related to their sexuality aren't here to tell us anymore, obviously. So we can only go off the stories of the survivors and people who knew people who completed suicide. And Professor Reisman, would you like to say something about the ADF census data in terms of what it says about these, about the population, about the LGBTIQA sure. plus population? I've just pulled up in front of me the, the data. It's in my submission that's from the 2019 defence census, so the most recent one, on the question whether attracted to persons of the same sex um, from the total permanent ADF, 4%. 
attracted to persons of the same sex and persons of a different sex, 2%, um, identifies as transgender, 0.5%. And there are breakdowns by Navy, Army, Air Force as well. I don't know if you want me to go through that's those. Fine. That's fine, um, that's in your submission. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Would you like to add anything? And there's similar statistics for the reserve. Sorry, just for the reserve, it's similar statistics as well. Thank you very much, Professor Reisman. Associate Professor Bourne, you have recently undertaken a great, you know, a, a huge amount of research in terms of looking at data relating to mental health and the LGBTIQA plus communities. Can you tell the commissioners just a bit, a little bit about Private Lives 3 and then writing themselves in for what they, what they were about and what they aim to do? Of course, I'd be happy to. So as I mentioned before, these are um, what are called community surveys. They're focused specifically on LGBTQA plus people. Private Lives is a survey of adults aged 18 and over, and it broadly speaking examines a whole range of health and well-being related issues. So a lot of questions relating to suicidality, other aspects of mental health and well-being, alcohol and other drug use, housing and homelessness, family violence, experience of stigma, discrimination, violence and abuse, access to healthcare services, and whether or not that was or wasn't LGBTIQ inclusive. Um, Writing themselves in four is, is a broadly similar study to writing to private lives, um, but it's a survey of LGBTQA plus young people aged 14 to 21. And given the age cohort, it's more focused on both the issues and the contexts that are of salience to LGBTQA plus young people. So in that respect, it focuses more on schools, colleges, um, TAFEs, universities. It focuses on the experience of um, coming out, who you've disclosed your gender identity or sexuality to, the, you know, how accepted you felt. Um, but then there's a range of other questions that are quite similar relating to mental health, suicidality, self-harm, drug use, family violence, stigma and discrimination. Thank you. Operator, please display exp.0006.1533. Associate Professor Bourne, what does the research say about why LGBTIQA plus people are an at-risk or a priority population with respect to mental health, suicidality and suicide? Why they're considered an at-risk population is really on the basis of exceptionally high rates of suicidality that we observe in these surveys. And I should say that these surveys replicate what we found in previous iterations. It's called Private Lives 3 because it's the third in a series. It's called Writing Themselves in 4 because it's the fourth in a series. And so the figures I'm about to tell you are not one-off instances. Um, they, they kind of build upon what, what a body of evidence that's been growing for some time. Associate Professor, I'll just get the operator to please display, display of that document 1550. And if we could perhaps start with psychological distress. Of course. So uh, what you're seeing here is a measure called um, the K10, which is a commonly utilized measure of psychological distress used in a range of contexts um, in surveys such as ours, but can it also be used in things like general practice or in uh, acute mental health, in mental health settings as a screening tool for psychological distress. And what we've done here is we ha you, you score people based on their answers as to having low, moderate, high, or very high levels of distress. And what we've done in the middle column is presented the findings from the LGBTIQ adults in Private Lives 3. And on the right-hand side, we provided the best available estimate well, that was available at this point in time in 2019 um, uh, of what those same figures look like in the general population. And really what you see is an enormous, just a strikingly, startlingly high difference um, in those, in that rate of high and very high psychological distress, at least four times higher um, than we observe among the general population. And operator, please display 1551. So that's the same data, but with respect to LGBTQA plus young people, where we've displayed it graphically here, which I think just provides, again, a very striking illustration of that, uh, of just how starkly different 
the experience of psychological distress can look like um, for LGBTQA plus young people. And operator 1552, please. These are perhaps the most um, concerning data in the entire report. Um, so again, what we've done here is we've tried our best to um, draw a comparison between the LGBTQA plus adults in our survey, Private Lives, and we've compared that to the best available estimate we could from the general, pop from general population studies. Um, in the red bar shows LGBT uh, IQ participants in the gray bar, the general population. And visually, it's quite arresting um, as you reflect upon the wildly different rates of um, suicidal ideation, um, uh, lifetime suicide attempts, and suicide attempts in the past 12 months. And as you see, they are highlighted um, uh, LGBTIQ people, about one in three having attempted suicide at some point in their lives, um, which is eight times higher than what we would expect to see in the general population. And operator 1553, please. To reinforce a, a, an already very somber point, um, these are the data from young people. Um, and these are uh, age matched, so it makes it, a, it's a bit of a clearer comparison from our study to studies of young people in the general population. So here we're just looking just at those who are 16 and 17 year olds. Um, but you observe a similar pattern of disparity, uh, and one in four, that's one in four, LGBTQA plus young people having attempted to take their lives at some point in their life, bearing in mind they're only at most 17 years old at the time they participated. Um, and 59% uh, having had thoughts of taking their own life uh, at some point, which is considerably higher than what we would expect to see in other populations. And it's five times higher than the general Sorry, population. five times higher, yes. yes. And operator, the next page, please. So trans LGBTIQ people are not all the same. And this is a point that I think we'll re return to on a few occasions. Um, we're as diverse as any other section of the Australian population in being golden old and young and rich and poor and every ethnicity. Um, and so our experiences of suicidality don't always look the same. And it's really, I say really nicely, it's really horribly illustrated in this particular slide, which shows how that experience of diversity, of suicidality can look very different depending um, or based on gender identity. And it's high across the board. It's all, you know, it's always high regardless of your gender identity, but it's highest among trans and gender diverse people, particularly among trans men, as you see here. So 52.9% of um, trans men having attempted to take their own life at some point, um, and 45.6% of trans women having attempted to take their own life at some point among adults, uh, and that's 46.9% of trans men uh, in the young people study of 14 to 21 year olds. So um, yeah, just appallingly high figures that um, really require contemplation and um, well, and, and action to say the least. Thank you, Associate Professor. I'm going to move to a different topic regarding factors associated with poor mental health, suicide and suicidality. Ms. Bernasocki, why is it important to identify the factors associated with poor mental health, suicidality and suicide for this priority population? Thank you. Um, please let me know if I need to move closer still. I um, can hear you fine. Thank you. Sorry, please. Thank you. Um, so when we look at the factors that are associated with suicidality, we start to get a more complex understanding of how suicidality might arise for someone who is LGBTIQA+, and it helps us identify the sites for intervention so that we can create targeted suicide prevention responses. So something else that thinking about factors around suicide is really useful for is it locates suicidality outside of the person who's LGBTIQA+, 
um, as we've heard Professor Reisman touch upon the historical context around stigma and discrimination that LGBTIQA plus people face has meant that the high rates of suicidality among our population has been conflated with being LGBTIQA plus. So stigma and discrimination tells us that because you're LGBTIQA plus, that might be why you have higher rates of suicide action. But we know this is not the case. So what, this, what our understandings of looking at factors that give rise to suicidality does is it shows that the experiences that LGBTIQA plus people have by existing in the world actually put them at higher risk of experiencing thoughts of suicide and moving towards suicidal behaviour. Thank you. I'll just, if um, I can just ask you to pause there. I'll come back to you in a moment, Miss. Bernasocki, I just want to ask Associate Professor Bourne, just regarding the factors, what did your research show about the factors relating to poor mental health, suicidality and suicide? Uh, the single biggest, most reliable and commonly observed factor associated with suicidality among LGBTIQ people is the experience of stigma, discrimination, violence or abuse on the basis of someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. So in performing a range of statistical analyses, we see that um, young, young cisgender um, LGB people were two and a half times more likely to have attempted suicide um, if they had experienced uh, harassment based on their sexuality in the last 12 months. Um, uh, people, adults, cisgender adults, if they'd experienced um, that kind of stigma, discrimination or violence, they were 50% more likely to have attempted suicide. Um, uh, and trans and gender diverse adults who'd experienced sexual harassment or assault on the basis of their gender identity were two and a half times more likely to have attempted suicide in the last 12 months. There are a range of other factors that come into play, but the, the factor that we observe time and time again, not just in our studies in Australia, but in other parts of the world, is the most important issue was whether you have been abused um, or had acts of violence um, posed against you by others because of your sexuality or gender identity. And when we use the terms stigma and discrimination, can I just unpack that? What, do you, what is meant by stigma and what's meant by discrimination in the context that you're talking about in your research? Yeah, so I think when we're talking about stigma, we're talking about, um, we're talking about wanting to ensure that someone doesn't feel, that feel, someone feels accepted and feels respected for who they are and someone doesn't feel, isn't made to feel ashamed for who they are by the actions or the comments of others around them. Discrimination um, would be that you are, for example, not receiving, um, you're not being treated fairly on the basis of your sexuality or gender identity. Thank you. And Professor Reisman, in your research, did you come across any of the stories of the narratives that you were having, you know, the people that you were having conversations with? Was stigma and discrimination an, an issue that arose in your research? They did, but I, I would make a few points um, just to caution in terms of where that fits with my research is they were far more common historically, which, which I think is a good thing that there's, there's less stories of that from the people who are currently serving or recently serving, but certainly from people who served during the era of the ban, I mean, the ban was discrimination quite, quite blatantly, but also the stigma of if they were caught the stigma of being perceived to be gay or lesbian might get them targeted for abuse within a particular unit. Um, if someone was kicked out, often those people were so ashamed of what happened to them that they didn't tell anyone why they left the defense force or only told the closest of confidants because there was stigma attached to that. And that was, to be honest, that was the leading cause for people that we interviewed who did attempt suicide was because they were kicked out of the defense force or from the anecdotes of people who did die by suicide was because of that. Then, and again, probably the second most common um, examples that came up were people who experienced bullying or harassment. Um, one particular example, I remember, it was a person who was perceived to be gay, um, wasn't open about it at the time, this was in the early 90s, who even was thrown overboard from a ship when the ship was docked at sea. That, that was how bad the bullying got for that person. 
Um, again, I guess to put a slightly better light on it, more recently, I haven't come across as many stories of that, uh, of bullying and harassment, but that doesn't mean that they don't happen. Um, I certainly, the most recent example of a suicide that I heard about was someone at the Australian Defence Force Academy who completed suicide in 2013, I believe, around then, um, because of um, stigma, bullying, harassment around their sexuality or gender identity. And Professor, just in terms of the context, when, when you talk about your research on current serving members, how many of those current serving members did you have and for what, what period are we speaking about? Sure. Sorry, when I say currently serving, it means we did the interview sometime between um, 2015 till 2018. So I guess during that period. Um, and they were about 40% of the people we interviewed were currently serving at the time that we interviewed That's them. 40% of the 140... 40% of 140. I've got it written down somewhere. If you give me a moment. Okay. 40% of the total amount of people that you interviewed as part of your research. Thank yes. you. Operator, can you please display exp.0006.0011.0001 And while the operator is displaying that, Ms. Bernasocki, I'm going to come back to you and, and ask you this question. How does from your experience working at Switchboard, how does stigma and discrimination impact on a person's mental health? And you can separate those two terms, if you like, stigma and discrimination, noting that they're separate terms. Um, so stigma and discrimination impact people in different ways, I would say. I think discrimination can have impacts on people's mental health that contributors contributes to feelings of isolation, loneliness, um, feeling like they don't belong, becoming a burden, and all of these things can be associated with suicidality. I think stigma is more complicated because I think the stigma that I'm thinking particularly around suicidality, that the stigma associated with suicide more generally interacts with the stigma of being LGBTIQA+. And what we see through our services is that stigma may prevent people from being able to access support. Discrimination may also prevent people from being able to access support because of what happens when they go to those services, whereas stigma might prevent someone from feeling like they can access support or talk about thoughts of suicide with a service or come out as being LGBTIQA+. I think also stigma and discrimination impact the development of a secure LGBTIQA plus identity. Um, that we know that social connection, um, the ability to be proud about being LGBTIQA plus are all protective factors toward people feeling like they can exist in this world and that they do have supports around them through tough times to have that resiliency to get through mental distress. So stigma and discrimination, I guess, impact mental well-being, but then we also see the consequences through help-seeking behaviour. There's also the possibility that it's not just for LGBTIQA plus people where discrimination and stigma are active. It's also about how other people treat LGBTIQA plus people because of those same processes. Thank you. And the document that is up on the screen there is a document called Beyond Urgent, which is the National LGBTIQ plus Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Strategy 2021 to 2026. And operator, if you can please go to 1004 of that, of that document. Not sure if you can see that page on there. I can't see it on my screen as yet. It's 1040. It's what contributes to worse outcomes. You've spoken a little bit about stigma and discrimination, but Associate Professor Bourne, can you see that page in front of you? Would you like to comment on the on on those out on what it says there about the contribution to worse outcomes and whether that was something that you saw in your research. I mean, absolutely. Um, it, it was, uh, I work a lot with the organization that produced this document, the peak body for LGBTIQ organizations in Australia. Um, and they drew on a range of the, uh, the research that our centers conducted in, in generating this list, in this list of outcomes. So it's very much reflected 
in our data, these experiences of discrimination, um, the social isolation, I think is one perhaps to pick up that hasn't been mentioned as much so far. So um, people who feel excluded, um, people who feel marginalized, people who don't have access to social support or peer support networks are also within the LGBTIQ community, I mean now, we're also at a considerably elevated risk um, of suicidality. Um, the issue around access, um, particularly access for mental health services, is an important one, which I think Anna, Anna touched on, but perhaps just to, to go a, a step further. Um, you know, we, we know that a lot of LGBTIQ people can struggle to access mental health services that are understanding and affirming of their needs. Um, by which I mean um, going to a mental health service provider at the point at which you're, you can, of course, be feeling very vulnerable and feeling in a, you know, in, a, in a very emotional state, that is not the point in time where you, want to have, where you want to have to explain to them what queer means or what trans and gender diverse means. But unfortunately, um, many LGBTQ people are faced with mental health practitioners who aren't familiar not only with the language and terminology of this community, but they're not familiar with um, the cultural contexts of LGBTIQ people, the different kinds of experiences that we have, the, the kind of the, the different contexts of relationships um, and sexual relationships, um, not familiar with the factors and forces that can shape um, poor mental health outcomes. So, you know, the, these kinds of things not necessarily further exacerbate, but they certainly don't assist in a scenario where we know the rates of mental ill health and suicidality are so high. Thank you. And Mr. Ball or Ms. Bernasocki, would you like to comment on intersecting discrimination or anything about intersectionality as a, a factor that may be associated with poor mental health or suicidality or suicide? And, or suicide? Do you like to yeah, I mean, I think that um, LGBTIQ plus people, like all people, have intersectional identities. Um, and at the point where people have the intersections, for example, of being Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, or you've got them up on the screen at the moment, um, and other identities where you are discriminated against, it can have a compounding impact. Um, one example I think can be is also where people feel like they need to make choices between their identities for a sense of belonging. Um, as an example, people might feel like they need to choose between their faith and their sexuality. And one of the things we see in our work at Switchboard is that people want to feel included in, and belonging in their communities as well as being part of LGBTIQA plus broader communities. Some of the most protective factors for people of faith can be actually to be embraced by their faith. And that can be a direct protective factor to suicide. I would say that works in other workplace contexts too, particularly where there's a sense of comradeship or comrade camaraderie, where people might be in close contact. The ADF would be a primary example, where people are part of a broader community. It would be important for LGBTIQA plus people who are in that community to be able to connect and feel accepted in that community. Um, and that's that kind of intersectional identities where people don't just leave when they become a veteran, when they go to work, when they walk into their place of worship, uh, when, they, when it's days of cultural significance, they don't want to feel that they need to park one identity, um, leave it at the door and uh, in order to have their own, uh, to have... Uh, to participate in community events. Um, you want to add that? Yeah, I think something to add, um, and we have research that will be coming out on this being released in September, so next month. But what we've heard in interviews um, in a study that we've recently undertaken, 20 interviews with LGBTIQA plus people in a sample where half the um, participants either identi identified as um, people of colour or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander is that the experience of 
feeling like only part of your identity is an, is affirmed in any given moment. So whether your LGBTIQA plusness is what's more, more prominent or whether it's around being in a multicultural space and having your faith or your um, cultural background visible but not your LGBTIQA plus can create this sense of fatigue that it really wears people down to not be in places where actually their, you know, holistic well-being can, can I guess, thrive and be visible and have a strong sense of belonging. And I think that's really important in the context of suicidality because we're talking about how people feel connected to themselves, the world around them, other people, and what it is that helps them feel like they can stay alive. Thank you. And Professor Reisman, in terms of your work, did you come across the issue about intersectionality or dual identities, for example? Sure, I'll, I'll respond to that and I might quickly add something to what Adam said before as well about access. But regarding intersectionality, it was actually a challenge for, for our research because we do, as researchers, take an intersectional approach, but almost everyone we interviewed was what we might call white or European. Um, I went back through the data and one veteran who served in the 1990s was Aboriginal. One who served in the 90s and 2000s was Asian. Seven of the currently serving, and again, when I say currently, when we did the interviews were Asian, and one currently serving person was Aboriginal. Everyone else would, came from a European background, white, European, whatever word we want to use. That, I think, says a lot about the ADF in general, but it, it also doesn't surprise me. From my previous research on Indigenous military service, I knew that the first study into cultural diversity in the ADF was done in 1993. And that study found that indigenous participation in the ADF was actually relatively mirrored in, in mainstream Australian society. So around the 2% mark, 2 to 3%, and that actually hasn't really changed much. But people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds has always been exceptionally small. So we, so we had so few people from those backgrounds I guess what is a good sign or telling of some progress is that of the few people we had from those backgrounds, they were currently serving, which shows that perhaps there is a bit of a change in the ADF. For those people, we did ask about experiences of racism. Um, the Aboriginal person who served in the 90s certainly did have a few incidents of racism against him as well. For the currently serving people, interestingly enough, all of them, bar one of them who started serving in the 90s mentioned once or twice you know, being called something, but for almost his entire career, no problems. And the currently serving people didn't mention any problems. So, which again, this is a good thing, I think, obviously, um, that they weren't feeling some of these challenges that other people from uh, in, in other communities where there, where there are problems of uh, intersecting identities happen. Where there were a few intersecting identities that, that were, that did stand out, HIV status. Um, two of the people we interviewed were HIV positive. One served in the 90s one currently serving, and th that was something that they were all very secretive about. They were There was that sense of shame and stigma around it, to be honest, that they didn't want to tell even people who were also LGBTIQ within the Defense Force about it, but also there were career implications, which is why they kept it secret, which put a huge strain on both of their mental healths, the currently serving and the, the person who served in the 90s. The other intersecting one that was very prominent was actually around gender, in that and this is around, especially the currently serving women that we interviewed, quite a lot of them said they had more challenges as a woman than as a lesbian. Like several of them put it that way. They said being a woman, the sexism that they were subjected to was a bigger problem than anything about their sexuality. And some of the trans people had interesting observations. Um, some of the trans women noted that all of a sudden, once they were affirmed in their gender and they were seen as women, they suddenly were subjected to sexism and were treated very differently to when they were, um, before they had transitioned. And the trans men noted suddenly acquiring male privilege and all of a sudden being treated much better, a bit more respect than they had previously. But I guess the one thing I just wanted to add to what Adam said earlier about access, this came up especially with currently serving trans members. This was a huge issue of access to services, access to affirming healthcare, in that because of the, the, let's say, bureaucratic nature of the ADF, just trying to get permission to see a gender specialist could take some time, and then getting the appointment with the gender specialist could take time. Meanwhile, they're waiting and not able to access affirming care, affirming hormones, which outside the ADF 
GPs can prescribe. It isn't something that you need to go to a gender specialist anymore. Um, and this, there's research done into trans health that says that the point when a person decides they want to access affirming care, that is when they are at most risk of suicide. This is from research into trans health, yet that is the point where they are meeting the delays within the Defence Force. I think that's an important thing we need to consider. Thank you, Professor Reisman. Just on help seeking, before we move to perhaps factors that are associated with improving mental health outcomes. Associate Professor Bourne, you've done some work around help seeking and you've touched just briefly about barriers to seeking help. Would you like to add anything to the comments you've already made about help seeking? I'm trying to think what more I can say that has been said by my, by my learned colleagues. Um, uh, I, I mean, perhaps just uh, perhaps just to kind of underline a point with some statistics, if it if it if it pleases the commissioners, um, when asked about their engagement with mental health uh, service providers, one in five of our respondents in the adult survey felt that their sexuality wasn't respected when engaging with those mainstream providers, and forty three percent of trans and gender diverse people felt that their gender identity wasn't respected when engaging with a mental health provider. And when, when asked uh, in a kind of short answer question, you know, what, what, what shaped their answer to that previous question, we heard a lot about being asked uh, invasive questions. Um, uh, you know, many trans and gender diverse people are subject to lots of questions around the state of their bodies at the moment that they make a disclosure of their gender identity. Um, a, a, a strange fascination about what exists between someone's legs at that point in time, I'm, to put it rather crudely, I'm afraid, um, in, in an entirely inappropriate question in many contexts. Um, use of the wrong of incorrect pronouns, making assumptions about their gender identity due to gender presentation, um, pathologizing aspects of their lives um, without necessarily understanding queer communities. So, you know, if they were in open relationships or non-monogamous relationships, making assumptions about what that must mean about their mental health and well-being without understanding or um, or acknowledging kind of different cultural norms that exist. So, so those were, and and this is um, kind of these these kinds of findings are very much reinforced in some of the qualitative um, research, which I think Anna's kind of alluded to previously. Thank you. And operator, if you can just pull up that same document at page dot one zero four one. Associate Professor Bourne, this is a list in the strategy beyond urgent around what promotes mental health and wellbeing amongst the communities. What did your research find about what are some of the factors associated with good outcomes, if you like, when it comes to mental health? Um, I think I mentioned this previously, um, but I can expand upon it. I, I, Connection to community um, is actually one of the most reliable predictors of better mental health outcomes and reduced suicidality for LGBTIQ people. So knowing and being connected to um, other LGBTIQ people is, again, a very, very commonly observed um, a protective factor against suicidality um, for, for these communities. Feeling um, supported at the point of disclosure, funnily enough, um, not rocket science, but again, a kind of very important one um, to, 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 to acknowledge. Um, and there's a very strong association between people who were supported by friends, family, workmates, colleagues, school friends, sports teammates at the point at which they, disclose, they made that disclosure. Like, it is one of the most... Uh, um, anxiety provoking moments when you're a member of the LGBTIQ community is thinking, well, how is this person going to react at the point at which I make this disclosure? And as we often say, disclosure is a process, not an event. It's something you have to do over and over and over again. Like I still find myself having to, um, I still have to out myself in various um, scenarios, even as a 39 year old. Um, and I still, you still at that point of thinking, shit, how, so, excuse me, um, how is the, how is this person going to react and respond in this situation? And so, um, sorry to labor a point, 
but the you know a, a strong affirming and supportive response at that point in time has a very very strong association with with mental health outcomes because it isn't something you do once it's something you're doing um, over and over again um, and then I and and then I guess just a final point is a is about um, I want to I'm trying to find the right word like visual representations and and symbols and so making visible displays of um, of acceptance and inclusion of LGBTIQ people is important. It's it's not just about it, it's not just a pretty range of colours uh, on a flag or on a poster or on a wall, but those kinds of symbols say to LGBTIQ people that you have been heard. We've thought about you. We've acknowledged you. We recognise you exist. To some extent, we celebrate you, and those things matter because they help foster a sense of being in an inclusive and an affirming environment. They can't exist in isolation though. Like it can't be just a flag, it can't be just a rainbow lanyard. You have to then ensure that all of the systems and processes that sit behind that within the organization are also affirming of, uh, of you and who you, and, uh, and of your identity. Otherwise it can feel um, there's a big, dis you know, you walk into a space thinking it's gonna be a safe environment for you because there's that rainbow flag and then suddenly there isn't. So I might be wandering slightly off topic there, I apologize. I think I was, I was talking about the enabling, I really guess what I'm talking about is enabling and affirming environments that broadly speaking help to achieve better outcomes around mental health and suicidality. And what role does a workplace have in terms of improving mental health outcomes for employees? We spend an awful lot of our time in our workplaces <laughs> um, and it can occupy an awful lot of our, of our headspace outside of work. So, um, I mean, many of the things I guess I've already alluded to in terms of those visible displays of inclusion and acceptance, I think those, those are important. Finding opportunities to facilitate um, uh, queer connections, so LGBTIQ connections within workplaces is important. Ensuring that your documentation um, and processes acknowledge gender diversity and sexuality is important. We are way past the time where it's acceptable to have um, an intake form or an assessment form that asks you a binary male or female gender question. Um, uh, you know, think about asking questions around sexuality. If if that person, the answer to that question might have bearing upon the experience or the situation that you're present that 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 you're talking about. You don't always have to ask the question, but think about would knowing this help us design a better work environment um, for you know for for um, for the service personnel, I guess, in in, in this instance. Um, so those are those are some um, practical steps that workplaces can do in in terms of being affirming. Thank you. And Ms. Bernasoki, in terms of what workplaces can do to be more accepting or inclusive and looking at reducing stigma and discrimination, do you have any views about what workplaces can do to make sure that that is done better? I think Adam has covered that quite thoroughly. Um, what I would add is that it's about setting a culture within a workplace for LGBTIQA plus people to have celebrations of their identity and connect with one another. When you think about what a, a workplace could be where LGBTIQA plus people feel safe and they're thriving, um, it's, I'm imagining a space where you've got people who feel comfortable to be out about their gender and sexuality, where you celebrate important days on the LGBTIQA plus calendar, whether that's their own pride, uh, significant occasions like where a purple trans member. Um, other things that can help foster this environment is ensuring that people in a workplace have training uh, across all levels of the workplace, from reception through to people who are, um, at, you know, the, a workplace isn't just people who are running programs or organizing. It can be the first person that someone comes into contact with. It can be the HR department. I think these kind of inclusive and affirmative practice trainings can go a long way. Um, and I think workplaces where there's strong leadership 
that responds to, I guess, political and discursive moments where LGBTIQ across lives come into the media or there's a sustained campaign around, um, you know, for example, what happened over the weekend at the Shroud of Remembrance, where there's leadership that can respond to these attacks on our community and actually say, as a workplace, we do not support this. We see our LGBTIQA plus um, employees and we support you and, you know, we think you're fantastic. You actually go a long way to creating a space where people feel like they want to be. Thank you. Yeah. Could I just add very briefly, Anna just reminded me of something um, that was particularly important. Um, having a policy and a process that can be followed on occasions where acts occur that are not acceptable is absolutely essential. So if people are subject to stigma, discrimination, abuse of any form in a workplace setting, they need to know that their employer will take the action which is appropriate in those circumstances and take disciplinary action, for example, against the perpetrator of that violence. And they need to have confidence that, that, that those policies and processes will be implemented fairly and consistently. Thank you. And Mr. Ball, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I'd like to add two things. One of the things is a lot, the events over the last fortnight, whether it's the Manly Ringo or the Shrine, demonstrate clearly about the dangers of whacking a rainbow on something where there hasn't been more in-depth work, which what Adam was talking about. There needs to be a strategy. Staff need to go on a journey and there needs to be, you cannot just raise a flag, um, like there should have been consultation. Um, and I think that um, that in both, uh, particularly the football instant, instance, is that people did not see that coming. And what I'm trying to say is significant stakeholders, whether they agree or disagree with the inclusion activities, need to know and be consulted uh, and not be blindsided because it is very damaging for the LGBTIQA plus community to have something be promised um, or flagged that it's going to happen, pun intended, um, and then have it removed. So I think the workplaces need to have strategies, it needs to be part of their strategic plan, and they need to run training at all levels of their organisation and have leadership on board. My other thing I want to say is I must, I am going to labour this point, one of the most dangerous times for suicide in our community is at the point of coming out. And supportive workplaces can play a huge role in this point of coming out. And I note, and I think this is very important for the Commission, is that up until 1992, at the point of coming out, some of our veterans were dishonourably discharged. This is the absolute antithesis to what we know today is a safe and suicide preventing workplace. And I think that undoubtedly that activity of dishonorable discharge at the point of disclosure and outing contributed to the high rates of, of suicide within that community. And I want that to be on the record. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Professor Reisman, in terms of your research and what you heard because you were having direct conversations with people who were either serving or formerly serving in defence. What do you say about what a workplace like defence can do to be more inclusive and accepting and other things that they may be able to do to reduce any impact negatively on their mental health? Sure, there's a lot to unpack there. And this is also sort of building on and responding to what the last three speakers have said. First off, just what Adam said about disclosure and Joe just said about coming out certainly resonates with the interviews we did. Two of the suicide survivors I interviewed, their suicide attempts were when they came out and were rejected. These were people, it was in the early 90s. Um, but I think that's a really important point. That was why they attempted suicide was because of the rejection that they experienced when they came out. One of those people went on because of his experience as a suicide survivor, actually wound up founding the first support group for serving members, so social and support group for serving members who were gay and lesbian. In 1994, it was called G-Force. Um, and he founded that because he didn't want people to go through what he went through when he came out and was rejected. And that organization was around for about four years. 
um, had about 30 some odd members. They even marched to the Mardi Gras in 1996 for the very reason that the founder, uh, David Mitchell, he knew that you can't be what you can't see which is an adage that we often use in the community and the importance of visibility to so ensure that other gay and lesbian members of the defense force knew that there was a place for them. So that group, it was very small and, you know, it, it was really, really important. In 2002, DEFCLIS was founded, which is the Defense LGBTI Information Service, still in existence today. They're the main support, advocacy, and social group for LGBTIQ plus serving people and also veterans as well. And, you know, again, that visibility has been so important. They've been able to offer peer support advice, especially more recently for trans members. When trans members are having challenges, the other trans members in DEFCLIS have been able to give them advice about policies and what they could do. So those sort of peer supports and visibility are really, really important in that, in that environment. But building onto these other questions about workplace inclusion, et cetera, I, I will give defense credit because they actually, from the early teens on, were really going in the right direction here. I think one of the most important gestures they did was started allowing um, LGBTIQ plus members to march in Mardi Gras in uniform, which they still allow today. And there are, it came from some oral history interviews and also reports in the media of LGBTIQ plus defense members who said they suddenly knew that they were safe to come out, felt more comfortable coming out once they saw that they could march in Mardi Gras and that others were marching in Mardi Gras. The service chiefs since the early teens have been actually really good at advocating for inclusion. Um, especially the, the previous vice chief of the Defense Force. I tip my hat to Vice Admiral Ray Griggs. He was a huge ally, really speaking up for the role of LGBTIQ plus people in the workplace, in defense. The, the chiefs came out and talked about how diversity was so important to a stronger defense force and how LGBTIQ plus people were part of that diversity among, uh, amongst other groups. You did see um, the issuing of rainbow lapel pins in the army and rainbow um, cufflinks. Um, you, you saw events being held on Ida Hobbit, the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. You saw some wear at Purple Day events. So this stuff was happening in defense. And I really hate that I'm using the past tense here because what changed was around 2017 and it was around the time of the marriage equality survey. This has come out in my interviews. The culture started to go quiet on inclusion in defense. They didn't completely stop, but things started to go quiet. You didn't see as much of this in the public. Um, documents that were previously in the public realm around inclusion suddenly weren't in the public realm. There was no diversity and inclusion strategy after 2017. The last one expired in 2017. And the reason for this, it, and it, it's really politics and it's political. And... I actually, again, I don't blame the service chiefs for this, to be quite honest. Um, I think this is coming from what was going on in the government at the time, where you had in the parliament and in the media, conservative politicians and pundits attacking the defense force for its inclusion agenda, calling it so-called social engineering. And when this happened, defense kind of went quiet. And, you know, and, and I think the most extreme example of this happened in 2021, when after there was an Ida Hobbit morning tea, there was a disgruntled defense ex service person who got in touch with members in the conservative media. You got a bit of a, a hoopla in the media. And all of a sudden, the defense minister at the time said, No more morning teas for events like this. Now, look, I get, look, the service chiefs have to do what the defense minister says. I get that and I respect that. If they didn't, we'd be a military dictatorship. So I'm glad, you know, that's a good thing. But when the politics of the day and the media are constantly attacking defense, and they have to go to ground. The, de the defense members who are LGBTIQ plus notice this. They notice this. And I think strong leadership is really important. Um, in earlier attacks, the leadership sort of did stand up to them. I get, I understand when the defense minister does it, there's nothing really you can do. You've kind of got to do what they say. But defense members notice this. And to bring it back to what happened this weekend with the shrine, I think just to throw on to that, I understand why the shrine canceled the, the rainbow lighting um, because there were safety issues and security issues. And I completely respect that. And I think the shrine made the right decision. But what was incredibly disappointing was to see ex-service organizations, the Victorian RSL in particular, coming out and saying, yep, that shouldn't have been lit up. This is an opportunity for leadership from those organizations and other places to say, 
This is why inclusion is important. This is about supporting LGBTIQ plus ex-service people. The statement the Victorian RSL president made in the media said, oh, well, it should only be lit up for service-related stuff. Well, this was service-related. It was about ex-service people in an exhibition who were LGBTIQ+, and I didn't see them complaining when it was being lit up for the Queen's Jubilee or when the former Prime Minister of Japan was assassinated, but they were when this happened. People noticed this, and so I guess inclusion in the workplace, all of these things that Adam and Joe and Anna have talked about is so important. When you see it being withdrawn, that's even worse in many ways than it having not been there in the first place. Thank you, Professor. I'm going to move to a different topic and then noting the time, I'm going to ask each of you if you have any recommendations that you would like to make to the Commission and Professor Reisman, we will come to your point in your submission about the apology. So I want to allow some time for that. But Ms. Bernatsoki, I want to ask you about suicide prevention frameworks. What would a suicide prevention framework for the LGBTIQA plus communities look like? And what is the, the essential parts of that suicide prevention framework? That's a very big question. And it's a question that is very close to my heart in doing this work because I think it is absolutely needed in this country. We've heard the statistics today and they are extraordinary. If we are to create a suicide prevention framework that addresses suicide for LGBTIQA plus communities, it firstly needs to start with lived experience. It needs to begin by bringing LGBTIQA plus people from various priority populations within the LGBTIQA plus community. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander LGBTIQA plus people, including veterans as well. We're talking quite broadly together to actually hear from them what it is that's going to help them stay safe from acting on thoughts of suicide. This framework would need to look at prevention so what are the strategies we need to put in place before someone is even thinking about suicide? It would need to look at intervention. What are the strategies that can be implemented at the point where someone is having thoughts of suicide? Something I also want to make clear, um, and I think we didn't discuss this earlier when we were looking at the statistics, what those statistics don't tell us is that a lot of LGBTIQA plus people actually live with thoughts of suicide for decades. So we hear from LGBTIQA plus people that thoughts of suicide can start very young. We're talking before the age of five and that they might live with those thoughts for their entire lives. So we know that people actually have ways of managing distress. So we need to work with lived experience to learn and hear what those ways are so that we can put them into strategies um, that LGBTIQA plus people will, um, into strategies and services that LGBTIQA plus people will support them when they're in distress. A framework would also need to include aftercare, so supporting LGBTIQA plus people after a suicide attempt, as well as prevention. So looking at what can we do where there is a suicide of someone who does identify as LGBTIQA plus. And within this framework, we would need to address the systemic issues as well. So looking at access to gender affirming healthcare, um, as well as issues around data collection, coronial reports, um, as well as some prevention strategies around how do we actually have safer conversations around suicide, particularly for LGBTIQA plus people, as what we know from these statistics is what these high percentage actually show us is that we have a lot of lived experience, which means that we do talk about suicide in our communities, but we don't necessarily have safe ways to do that. Um, other things that I would incorporate into a framework come from understanding what the protective factors are. And Adam quite eloquently put some of these protective factors together and I'm going to summarise them again. So creating services and programs where connectedness with LGBTIQA plus community is, is a strategy because we know that connectedness with community moderates severe suicidality for LGBTIQA plus people where we can create support that generates feelings of care. And again, that connectedness with communities and peers is, is what LGBTIQA plus people often describe as life-changing. 
Um, something else that I think we're hearing today in terms of our discussions around coming out um, is also that we know that when narratives around gender diversity and sexuality are seen as sources of strength, that reduces feelings of burdensomeness, which then in terms is a protective factor towards thoughts of suicide. So the strategies that come through this framework would be around pride, inclusion, visibility. Um, how do you actually, how do LGBTIQA plus people um, see their futures? And often that's through visibility of seeing um, other people who have lived through suicidal distress who are LGBTIQA plus. Um, Noah mentioned an anecdote earlier of how one of the first support programs was created. Is that through these initiatives where people who have these lived experiences say, this is what I needed or this is what I can give back. You've got a really strong foundation for building um, services that are going to support LGBTIQA plus people. And we also know through research that focusing on lived experience and giving people the opportunity to contribute their lived experience can have a really positive um, change in an LGBTIQA plus person's, um, I guess, self-concept and how they've internalized stigma experiences of suicidality. So I think in creating a framework, you can do two things. It can be very, um, it can be very rewarding for people to involve, but then we're also creating the services and programs that are going to address the needs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Associate Professor Bourne, if Defence and DVA were designing health and wellbeing strategies, should there be a specific targeted strategy for the LGBTIQA communities? Uh, that's a difficult question for me to ask it definitively. Um, I think there's strengths and weaknesses to, to, to having singular strategies for each individual at-risk population or having overarching strategies that attend to those individual at-risk populations. To some extent, I think either can work as long as they take into account all of the things that Anna has so very eloquently articulated. We, you know, if you're having a, a public health has to address the needs of all people and a, a strategy has to address the needs of all people, but it needs to be focused. All health efforts have to be focused on the people who need the help the most. That's the principle of healthcare and broadly and certainly public health broadly. Um, it doesn't mean you have to have a strategy that's unique just for LGBTIQ people, just for disabled people, just for culturally diverse people, but it does mean that you need to recognize that certain populations are at more risk than others, otherwise you're doing them a disservice. You need to take account of the unique circumstances that shape suicidality and how those can be different for individual groups. Um, you need to take account of that lived experience in the way that Anna has so beautifully articulated. And you need to think about priority actions that you might want to take that are specific to certain populations. Now, all of those things can be encapsulated within one strategy, or you could think about having a body of strategies, um, uh, a collection of strategies, rather, um, where there's kind of specific attention paid to each. I'm not sure there's a sure and fast answer to which is best. Um, that would depend upon the broader circumstances of suicide prevention work that the ADF is doing, which I'm, I'm not as accustomed to. But is your view, just to make sure that I've understood that correctly, is your view that there should be a strategy, whether it's in one document or whether it's in, you know, in a separate document, there should be a strategy of some sort addressing the issue of poor mental health, suicide and suicidality for these communities? Categorically, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And no, I just really quickly yes. just built just something really quick because we've talked a lot about ADF defense. And I think in the question you just asked Adam was the first time I heard DVA raised. And I think in terms of DVA and ex service organizations in particular, which we haven't really talked about, and I know we're short on time, but of the people I interviewed, very, very few, I could probably count on one hand, were members of ex service organizations. And I think there are reasons for this, and a lot of that has to do with the history that ex-service organizations have a horrifically homophobic and transphobic history, 
um, most pronounced in the RSL, I'm sorry to say. Um, in 1982, the then president of the Victorian RSL very dramatically turned away a group of gay veterans from laying a shrine, uh, a wreath at the Shrine of Remembrance. Um, when the ban was lifted on LGB service in the end of 92, the RSL nationally came out against that and said the ban should stay. As recently as 2000, eight years after the ban was lifted, the RSL was still saying that gays and lesbians shouldn't be serving. Um, they only changed their tune around late 2005. That's just one ex-service organization. The people I interviewed, a lot of them, they weren't sure if they'd be welcomed by ex-service organizations. So that's not to say that the ex-service organizations were necessarily homophobic, but they also just didn't know because there was nothing to suggest that they would be welcomed. Two Vietnam veterans were were afraid at first to go to the Vietnam Veterans Association for help when they needed it. They did go and t and they said they actually were were treated with respect and it was fine, but they didn't know. And not knowing is sometimes a problem, which is one reason that one of my recommendations, aside from the apology, is around ex-service organizations also need to make it clear that they are welcoming, inclusive understanding of the needs of LGBTIQ plus veterans, because especially for ones who were kicked out of the defense force, that sense of, do I belong? Do I belong or not? I was kicked out of the defense force. Do I belong? Do I get recognized, respected as a veteran? They don't know. And ex-service organizations haven't really done anything from what I can observe to reach out and put any sort of sense of showing that they that they will support LGBTIQ plus veterans. Not to say they won't, but if people don't know, they don't know. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Ball, did you want to comment on that? Just very quickly to say, we must not forget partners, particularly bereaved partners of deceased servicemen and veterans, people, and in this case, people who are bereaved by suicide. And I think that there has been historical exclusion of partners, either at ceremonies or after their death. And I think, um, you know, we want to, I just, I don't have a lot to say about that. It's not part of my research, but I'm really aware of the work that we do at Switch Forward of supporting bereaved people and the need that if you lose someone close to you to suicide, whether that's a parent um, or a partner, it elevates your personal risk of suicide. So I would like to just sort of, let's not forget the partners of LGBTIQA plus people. Thank you, Mr. Borland. And, and sorry, and their families and children. Thank you. And their families Thank and children. You. I'm going to ask each of you in a moment for your recommendations. Before I do that, Ms. Gunasaki, just briefly, I know you've been doing some work around postvention. Can you just tell the commissioners briefly, and apologies, I have to ask you to be brief, but just briefly about postvention and why that's important for these communities? Absolutely. Um, postvention refers to implementing support or containing the impact of a suicide. In this context, we're talking about LGBTIQA plus suicides. What we've observed among our communities, particularly where an LGBTIQA plus person dies by suicide, that there can be quite large ripple effects across our communities. And part of that is because of, um, I guess, we're a community, firstly, um, and that we identify strongly with one another because we belong to a minoritized group where our genders and sexualities, um, I guess, unify us in many ways. So that kind of identification with one another means that if we uh, come into contact with someone who's also LGBTIQA plus who suicides, um, or perhaps they're a close friend or chosen family member, um, it can have a profound effect on our own well-being. And there are particular things that happen for LGBTIQA plus people after there is a suicide. Joe just mentioned it's quite common um, for the biological family of someone to be responsible for um, memorials and funeral services. If there's um, a discrimination and bigotry in the family, LGBTIQA plus people might be excluded from attending those ceremonies. We also hear that LGBTIQA plus people get blamed for suicide deaths. So I'm sorry, this is going to be quite violent to hear, but it's common for partners to hear that this person suicided because they because you made them gay. Um, we get told, um, I guess, profoundly hurtful things about loss. Um, so what prevention is, from our LGBTIQA plus community perspective, is looking at how a suicide affects our communities and putting out strategies 
uh, that are going to facilitate grief and loss and also contain um, the spread of information about the suicide. So what we do at Switchboard is we run peer-based LGBTIQA plus um, groups for people who've been bereaved through suicide. Um, currently that's an eight-week program and soon we'll have a drop-in group. We also provide prevention planning services. So, um, you know, even this week I found out about the suicide of LGBTIQA plus person of colour, the communities around this person will get in contact with us and we can help them develop a plan for how do they communicate about the death, what do they need to say, how do they communicate with family members, how can they have a memorial, what are the tributes and ceremonies that are going to help the community move from a place of deep distress toward healing. And it's really difficult. Um, the, the factor that's really important here is that those high rates of suicidal distress means that when there is a suicide, uh, so the high rates of suicidal distress among LGBTIQA plus people means that when you come in, an LGBTIQA plus person is affected by suicide, it's more likely to be close to an experience they've had in the past or something they live with, and therefore potentially more likely that they will experience suicidal distress after coming into contact or experiencing loss through suicide. So postvention is really important in the system of suicide prevention, and it often gets overlooked. Thank you very much. Start with you, Associate Professor Bourne. Do you have any recommendations or any final comments that you would like to make to the Commission? Sure, I'll make um, three final comments, um, I guess, put in the form of recommendations. Um, we talked a lot about the role of stigma, discrimination, and acts of abuse in shaping or reinforcing suicidality. Those acts are still very commonplace in the general population. Our survey data suggests that just over 40% of people of LGBTQ adults had experienced that in the had experienced verbal abuse in the previous 12 months. 24% had experienced. Um, harassment or offensive gestures, and 11% had experienced sexual assault in the last 12 months, right? So these are recent experiences. Um, the um, defense, I think, should, should know, they should be asking the question as to whether or not these experiences are happening within the defense forces. They should be taking the time to listen to and understand the experiences of LGBTIQ people to, to, to have a clear sense of whether or not this is a safe and affirming environment that it needs to be if we're going to prevent suicidality. So taking that time to listen and to understand and record. Um, a second point um, reaffirms what I was saying around mental health support. Uh, the defense forces and, um, and, and veteran services need to ensure they're putting in place the mental health supports that are safe and affirming for LGBTIQ people at the points they need the most. So at the points at which they may be coming out um, while, an active, while in active service, at the point at which they may be seeking gender affirmation. Um, and as others, as others have already highlighted, these are incredibly critical points where the likelihood of su suicidality is significantly elevated. So be sure that the mental health systems and services you have in place are understanding and responsive to LGBTIQ people specifically. Um, and thirdly, um, changing cultures in that first point I made and changing services in that second point I made takes time. Um, any kind of cultural change takes time. I suppose in the meantime, think about how to leverage the strengths at the disposal of the ADF. And actually that could come in, listening to some, some of my um, colleagues speaking, that could come in the form of things like um, leveraging those LGBTIQ networks in their various forms um, to be doing more in this space if they felt able to. There's a lot of interesting research around the role of peer, peer interventions um, that can be delivered to help better recognize, respond, and refer in instances of suicidality. We know they're elevated among LGBTIQ people. We know that LGBTIQ community connection is an important um, issue. So if you bring those things together and you can support 
and train people um, who are part of LGBTIQ support networks to recognize, respond, and refer, then that would be an, a, a more immediate action that, that, that could have significant benefit. Thank you, Mr. Ball and Mr. Ms. Bernasocki. Yeah, thanks. I have three recommendations and, and so does Anna. Um, I think wrapping around any recommendation and the thing we need to take away from our, this panel today is that we don't have poor mental health outcomes or high suicide rates in our communities because of who we are, but because of how we have been treated. And so any recommendations must be framed that way. Um, any plan that seeks to address veteran suicide, my, this is my recommendation one, any plan that seeks to address veteran suicide must have a carved out and specific section on LGBTIQA plus veterans, not because we need a catch-all list of different diversities in the community, but because of what we've heard today is the prevalence in the LGBTIQA plus communities. It needs to address the specific factors within our LGBTIQA plus veterans suicide and have targeted responses that are co-designed by LGBTIQA plus veterans, current service personnel and LGBTIQA plus services. And I think that any, any advisory group that might oversee a strategy, it must include an LGBTIQA plus veteran or a serving personnel um, with a lived experience of suicide or an expert, at the very least, an expert on this topic. Uh, my second recommendation is help seeking, is around help seeking. In the two recent Victorian Royal Commissions, the Royal Commission into Family Violence and the Royal Commission into Mental Health in Victoria, the Victorian Royal Commissions, it was established that LGBTIQ A plus people at the point of helping, help seeking wanted choice this means that they want to be given, not to be given one option. For example, in the form of a helpline, some LGBTIQA plus veterans might want to call a veteran specific helpline, while others might want to call an LGBTIQA plus specific helpline. To promote help seeking, all options should be readily available and promoted by HR, by superiors, and be on the workplace intranet. My final recommendation is for a national apology. And why is this important? What we've heard throughout is we have been you know, fortunate enough in this commission and I've listened in to hear the stories of LGBTIQA plus veterans who have served this country with pride, only to be the subject of witch hunts that led to dishonourable discharges. We know that for a service person, dishonourable discharge is one of the greatest shames. And shame, if left unaddressed, sadly, can lead many to suicide. The real shame, however, is how we have treated LGBTIQA plus veterans. And one very simple thing we could do as a country, sooner please, rather than later, is to give them acknowledgement of this great wrongdoing and apologize. And in that apology, a place in our national war memorial. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Before I move to the other witnesses, Commissioner, I note that it's on the two hour mark and we may need to adjourn briefly for the, trans the, the, for the transcript recorder to change over. And I'm, is this the, the right time? I, to I do think that? we do have to break for five minutes. I apologise to our witnesses. We are running over time. But the transcribing people can only go for two hours, and then we just have a we we'll just have a five minute break, and then come back and hopefully won't wind up very soon. Please bear with us. Thank you. We'll adjourn for five minutes. All rise. The Royal, the Royal Commission is adjourned for a five minute break.
Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide has resumed. Please be seated. Ms. Bridget, thank you for bearing with us. We had to just have it, that short break. As a commission pleases, Ms. Bernasocki, do you have any recommendations that you would like to make to the commission? I do, thank you. My three recommendations will be framed in terms of providing, providing support initiatives for LGBTIQA plus veterans, as I believe that's where my strengths are on today's panel. So firstly, my first recommendation in how to address suicide among LGBTIQA plus veterans will be to start by building capacity of LGBTIQA plus veterans to become more literate in suicide safety and to become better equipped to offer interventions and support one another in the pursuit, pursuit of preventing suicide. When you support the leadership of LGBTIQA plus veterans to take up space, you also create visibility and create the context in which more LGBTIQA plus veterans will, uh, I guess, become active. From there, my second recommendation would be to invest in LGBTIQA plus peer-led initiatives. In the suicide prevention sector, peer and lived experience initiatives are, I think, currently being evaluated and showing, um, I guess, uh, I guess, efficacious in responding to people who live and experience suicidal distress, creating safe spaces, alternatives to emergency departments, these initiatives where suicidality is demedicalized and offers support that is community-based is where you'll be able to address suicidality for LGBTIQA plus people that, I guess, um, that is accessible. That when you create these spaces that are designed by LGBTIQA plus people and for LGBTIQA plus people, you don't even get to the point where people are questioning whether they're going to be misgendered in a service or whether this program or initiative is going to be right for them because you've created something that they want to be in from the beginning. From the beginning. To do that, you need to ask LGBTIQA plus veterans what they need, what the services and programs are. Should you be creating services and programs where LGBTIQA plus veterans can talk about experiences of suicidal distress with one another? Should you be creating programs for LGBTIQA plus veterans who have been bereaved through suicide? This is the kind of inquiry for you to take to LGBTIQA plus veterans and hear from them what the programs and services are that they need. When you do this, you start to honour LGBTIQA plus people who have died by suicide. You, you start to create the context in which people can heal from these traumas. Lastly, and this is looking systemically at suicide among LGBTIQA plus populations, we need investment nationally in LGBTIQA plus suicide prevention. I don't think that the above recommendations that I have made can happen in a silo. I think that they should be done in partnership with LGBTIQA plus community-led organisations. But to do that, there needs to be financial investment as well as strategic investment into creating, I guess, uh, a bigger framework that can address suicide for our population. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor Reisman, your recommendations are in your submission, but please feel free to share those with the commissioners and perhaps you can also speak to what you have done in the past about seeking a national apology. Sure, thank you very much. From I made four recommendations. One is related to currently serving members and the ADF and the other three related to veterans. Um, for the currently serving one, first, I do just want to say, I know we've been going through a lot of risk factors and challenges facing the LGBTIQ plus community in general, but I do just want to say, having interviewed quite a lot of defense members, they're actually a pretty resilient, awesome bunch. Um, and one of the big themes that came out is that when things are going fine in defense, there's no problem, um, especially for the LGB members. When there's a problem, the defense force doesn't handle it well. 
seems to be a, a big theme that I've come across. And it's the trans and gender diverse people who've particularly run into challenges. And I won't go into details about that now, but I do just want to emphasize because th that there is an importance, that there is a resilience here as well. It's not all doom and gloom. A lot of people are actually having a pretty good experience in defense, and I, and I want that acknowledged as well. But that recommendation that's related to defense in particular goes back to what I hinted at before, that all of those inclusion activities and visibility needs to come back. The stuff that suddenly went quiet around 2017 needs to come back. And I guess in some ways this extends to the political class and the media as well. And I know that that's not something that can be controlled, but stop using LGBTIQ defense people in your culture war. Stop using them as a political football. Let them just get on with it because they've, they're doing fine if you leave them alone and let them get on with it. But the recommendation is about supporting inclusion activities and visibility within defense, which they were doing pretty well until 2017. Let's bring that back. The three recommendations relating to veterans. One of them is around DVA and ex-service organizations, and I hinted at this before, and I actually think that if you mix my recommendation with what Anna just went through, you'd get a pretty good recommendation, which is about making sure that those services are inclusive and, if nothing else, just visible to show that they're willing to support LGBTIQA plus veterans. Um, even putting out public statements or not putting out public statements like we saw um, with the shrine last weekend um, from, from one particular ESO, so that LGBTIQA plus veterans can feel welcomed within veterans communities to know that they belong. And of course, this extends to families as well. Now, the two big ones, the two big ones, and, and a lot of my attention in my submission and in what I've talked about has been around veterans because that's where the experiences of suicide I've come across primarily in my research of both attempted suicide um, and also anecdotes of, of people who did die by suicide. And they're, they're related recommendation. The first is a national apology. So m there are people who were kicked out of defense 30 years ago who are still suffering from it, believe it or not. There are some people who never recovered. They're a minority of people, but they exist. There are other people who, yes, they got on with their lives, but they didn't have a sense of closure. Like th this was something taken away from them. It hurt them personally. And I think the stories that you heard a few months ago from Danny Liversidge and Yvonne Sillett in many ways embody stories that I heard so many times over from people who were kicked out and just felt like there was a severance and there was never this connection or being seen as part of a veterans community. A national apology for the past practices and policies that discriminated against and persecuted LGBT people could go such a long way towards healing. We've seen the power of apologies to the stolen generations, to the forgotten Australians, relinquishing mothers, um, for victims of childhood sexual abuse. We've seen it when every single state and territory government has apologized for past laws and police practices that discriminate against LGBTIQ plus people. We've seen this happen overseas. The Canadian government, the UK government, and the German government have all apol issued apologies for past policies that discriminated against LGBT defense members. And may I add, in the UK and Germany, they were conservative governments that did that. They were conservative governments that did those apologies. So we know the power of apologies, the power that they can have for healing. So my recommendation is that the, the Commonwealth government and the chief of the defense force issue a public apology. Related to that, the second recommendation is about a redress scheme. Now, I do wanna emphasize, I use the word redress purposefully. I don't use the word compensation. The reason I use the word redress is because redress can take so many forms. And for the vast majority of veterans I've interviewed, it's not about money. It's not about, about that. But redress is about healing, being able to tell their stories. And we already have a model in place for this. The Defense Abuse Response Task Force, DART, was set up in 2011, I believe, ran until about 2016, I believe. I might have those years wrong. A small number of veterans I interviewed who suffered abuse in addition to what happened to them went through the DART process, and they all spoke favorably of it. For one veteran in particular, I remember she said this was the first time she felt like she was treated with respect from the defense and veterans community in her life. When the DART process ended, the government um, essentially gave the Defense Force Ombudsman, the DFO's office, power to do similar process. So you get a caseworker assigned to your case, they investigate, and they come up with a redress scheme where it might take the form of a restorative engagement, which usually would entail the, the person being able to tell their story to a senior official. 
Um, one of the veterans I interviewed who suffered abuse, she told her story of what happened to her to the then chief of army, who is now the chief of the defense force. And he was so moved by it that he even hand wrote a letter talking about how what he thought happened to her was horrible. And it was so moving to him. I, under the current laws, the current remit for the DFO can only examine abuse. A few of the veterans I interviewed did try to go to DFO over what happened to them with their interrogations and their discharge. It didn't meet the definition of abuse. My recommendation is quite simple. Take what you've already got in place. It's working. It's a great program and expand the remit so that the DFO can also investigate cases of LGBT IQ plus people who were discriminated against, persecuted, suffered under the policies. In a very small number of cases, there might be compensation involved. But the reason I emphasize redress is it's not always about money. And I know that when money gets involved, a lot of people suddenly, you know, get, get panicky and don't want to pay for it. It's about redress. It's about justice. So those are my main recommendations. To go to the other part of your question, so I first put these forward in a brief in 2018 that I sent to the then Defense Minister, Veterans Affairs Minister, Shadow Defense Minister, Shadow Veterans Affairs Minister, Green Spokesperson for those, and all the LGBTIQ members of Parliament. The response from the Greens was favorable. They said, yep, on board. The response from Labour, who at the time were in opposition, was a bit a small number replied with this sort of mm, interesting, maybe, but we didn't really get any commitments. The then defense minister just outright rejected it, um, sent a letter, not addressed to me, even though it should have been. Um, it's in an appendix in my submission. And the letter said, no, we're not issuing an apology. There's already um, been an apology for an abuse and there's already this DFO scheme. Well, as I said in my brief, and as I've reiterated here, these people aren't eligible for it. That is the reason why the scheme needs to be widened and an apology needs to be for the practices that did affect those people because it wasn't just abuse. So those are, are my four big recommendations for the, for the commission. Thank you, Professor. Commissioners, I don't have any further questions. Do you have some questions for the witnesses? Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Thank you all. Um, that was a very, very informative session. Um, I, I just have um, one's possibly more a comment, but we talked earlier about the things that can make things worse, I think came out of the national strategy um, and included in that was structural discrimination. And I, I um, had a session uh, recently with someone who just gave me some examples of that. And I thought it might be useful just to speak to that, just to illustrate what that, um, because these, these were current issues that the ADF um, IT system uh, records, um, this is the PMK system, records both sex and gender, but then this subsequently draws on the sex rather than the gender in the information that flows into other uh, systems. And the other was the lack of policies and procedures in relation to non-binary members. And uh, that might sound um, a little bit vague, but when it comes to the issue of what uniform do I wear and how am I to be addressed and what fitness test do I need to pass, it becomes very, very pertinent and practical um, to those individuals. So I just wanted to kind of share that. But um, I did want to ask a question. You talked about the importance of enabling an affirming environment and facilitating processes for inclusion. But again, drawing on some experience we had um, during the time on, of this commission, speaking to um, some ADF members, what was said to me was, um, was, you know, our job is pretty simple. We're here to go to war and kill people if we need to. Um, and we don't need all of this soft BS stuff. Um, and he said, I, did, I, I didn't have a problem before, but it's kind of given me a problem because they want to do all this training and everything else. So I just wondered what your response to that was, because I mean, clearly I'm not endorsing that, 
that um, particular position, but nevertheless, it was that person's individual kind of point of view. Uh, I guess I would reinforce that it's an individual point of view, and this is a broad church of people that I that, that I alluded to earlier, as diverse as any section of the population. And um, you know what? I think it's fantastic to some extent that some people feel that they don't need those support systems and structures around them, that they can carry out their duties without those networks and lanyards and rainbow flags because they can feel confident and affirmed in who they are anyway. I would say that all of the research that exists suggests that is not by any stretch the majority of people. Thank you. Did any others have any comment or response? Yeah, I would just say I think it's a false binary. Um, you can be trained to go to war and do inclusion activities. But, and the other thing around inclusion activities is they're not compulsory um, usually. So when there's an Idaho Hobbit morning tea, nobody is forcing you to go there and eat a scone. Um, it's usually optional for people on the base. So if you're the sort of person who doesn't really want to participate in that stuff, well, then nobody's forcing you to. Nobody's forcing you to march in Mardi Gras. Nobody's forcing you to watch the Mardi Gras on TV. But for various people in defense, these are important activities and they should be available and should be offered. And that doesn't take away from you being trained to, as you say, go to war and kill someone as well. Yeah, I mean, I would just add that every workplace, you know, we, we, we support people, we do secondary consult to workplaces at Switchboard Victoria. There is these people in every workplace and that's important to recognise that this is not particular to the ADF. And that I think that this goes back to some of our point about how you do this work. And it's about, as I alluded to before, about not whacking a rainbow on it and going through a process of allowing legitimate questions and journeys for all staff members to go on. I'm very passionate about this. We need to recognise that there are barriers for people understanding who our communities are and understanding the importance of, of what importance this would possibly have. There are some people who have genuine questions and there are some people who will never be on board. And we need to make space for those people who have genuine questions and need to find out about why this is relevant to them. Um, and that, that's what I would add. And I also hesitate against people who pretend to have genuine questions um, and, and don't. Um, I think some of the people at the Shrine of Remembrance, like, you know, the anger that they had, the threats they gave to staff, that's not genuine questions. That's bigotry. But I understand that there would be people in the veteran community and the service community that would want to ask some questions about why this is relevant. And to them, I say, go to the shrine and see what an amazing exhibition defending in pride is, as I did yesterday. And I believe your questions will be answered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas. Thank you for your evidence, which I found very informative. Well, I don't have any further questions. Thanks. I'm conscious of the time. I don't have any further questions either, but I do want to thank you for your evidence today and for all the research. And you've given us an awful lot to think about today. Um, Ms Musgrave, anything you want to ask? And I'm not sure if Ms Callan is still with us. I am Commissioner, but I have no questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the witnesses can be released from their summons, Commissioner. Yes, um, those of you who have uh, been summoned, you were released from your summons today. Professor Reisman, I, I'm conscious you're probably eight or nine hours behind us. I hope we didn't inconvenience you by getting you up very early, but I think we did. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for being with us and thank you for your evidence today. Commissioner. Yeah, thank I understand you. Ms Longbottom has some issues. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, thanks, Commissioner. If I could just briefly attend to a housekeeping matter. It concerns the tender bundle for the Wellbeing Centres Tasmania and ESOs panel before lunch. Um, if the operator could please display the correct tender list. Uh, can the witnesses leave us? If you, if you wish, <laughs> thank you. You're more than welcome to stay. Uh, commissioners, um, documents number nine and 10 in that correct list were not tendered before lunch. Um, may they please be tendered in the manner in which they're described in the list? 
Yeah, thank you. Then they'll be accepted and allocated the next lot of consecutive numbers. Thank you, Commissioner. That thank was you. all I needed to raise. Thank you. Um, if there's no other issues, we'll adjourn till tomorrow morning at 9am. All rise. The Royal Commission is adjourned until 9am the 4th of August 2022.